My first exposure to Metroid Prime was in March of 2005. It was my fifth birthday, and I was having a little party with my family. I remember looking at my different presents, and you could just tell that some of them were video games because of that recognizable shape. When the time finally came, I opened my two games to see this epic Ninja Turtles game, which I would go on to play the shit out of, but also this game, Metroid Prime. I vaguely recognized the character on the front from a game I had seen a few years before. My first impression of this game was that it was way too scary for me to handle, and I didn't make it very far. My brother is a few years older than me, and he was brave, so I'd watch him play instead. The especially memorable part for a five-year-old watching ended up being a lot of the boss fights. Thardis and Ridley were ginormous and terrifying, and nothing I had seen previously on my Nintendo 64 could compare to the spectacle of these guys. One moment in particular that I remember is when at the end of the game, you can see the player character remove their helmet. I hadn't expected the person underneath the suit to be a woman. The other protagonists that I was familiar with, like James Bond and the Kong family, weren't as enigmatic as this character, because I felt like her story was difficult for a five-year-old to understand. A few years later, I was brave enough to try beating the game myself, but even still, I felt too afraid to fight Thardis. I had my brother play through a few parts for me. I honestly don't remember much else of my early years with Prime, but I do know that I kept the hint system on and I had an absolute blast every time I played. Though I had seen Super Metroid before, this was my proper introduction to the Metroid series. For the longest time, I saw Metroid Prime as not only my favorite game of all time, but also as the literal perfect video game. As far as I was concerned, this game could do no wrong, and had zero room for improvement. This is by far my most replayed video game of all time, unless you count Minecraft, but I've put an absurd amount of time into Metroid Prime in particular. I missed out on so many titles that were coming out during the Xbox 360 and PS3 era because I was too busy playing Metroid Prime again and again. Only in recent years have I finally gotten around to playing games like The Last of Us, Bioshock, Halo, or the Arkham games. I still do not regret missing out on all of these monumentally excellent games in favor of just continuing to enjoy Metroid Prime, because I really did enjoy playing Prime that much. Replaying this game many times a year for nearly two decades has given me time to carefully examine Prime and consider every detail through a more critical lens. It wasn't until more recent years that I've come to question numerous aspects of this game's design. What really shaped my newfound perspective on this game was was engaging with other fans online. I have participated in lengthy discussions about Prime with many people that also think that this is quite literally a perfect video game. I think Prime is a fantastic game, but this particular video seems like it might be more critical than some viewers may be expecting. I'm very harsh on Metroid Prime, and I suspect that might be because I've replayed it such a ridiculous number of times. Like my other videos, I'm not interested in giving Prime the benefit of examining it in the context of its release. I will be comparing it to any modern title whenever I please, and I refuse the notion that examining an older game requires accounting for its time period. I'm sure that nearly all of these design aspects that I'm going to be criticizing are direct results of things like the game being the first of its kind, or the game having such a nightmarish development. This historical context may explain why things turned out the way they did, but they simply do not excuse this game from any and all criticism. If you want to excuse design issues by saying that this is an early 3D game on limited hardware, the game had development trouble, or that it's the first of its kind, then there are countless other videos out there for you that are more than willing to examine Prime in a historical context, especially with this game being touted as one of the Golden 3 best Metroid games of all time, often called the very best Metroid game of all time, I think it's okay for me to choose this approach. I don't really feel the need to justify the validity of my more critical and modern lens perspective any further than that, but I will at least make that perspective clear to viewers so that they know they're getting into. If you really can't handle someone declining to approach discussion of this game with the most favorable context possible, then this isn't the channel for you. As was the case with my other videos, this video will place focus not only on the games themselves, but also sometimes examine the reputation surrounding certain design aspects. Most people can agree that this game is excellent, but I found myself with a surprising amount of disconnect between my own personal views and some common opinions shared online. I do not intend to invalidate opposing viewpoints, but I do want to share my own ideas and explain myself well enough to make for an entertaining dissection of Prime. I also just want to say that I will spend a lot of 
time on some more nuanced ideas, and I think it's worth mentioning that the amount of time spent discussing a topic does not necessarily reflect the importance of said topic. With all of that preamble out of the way, it's time to examine Metroid Prime. The first segment of this game, like most games, is dedicated to teaching the player about the controls. On the GameCube, the game controls a lot like Resident Evil 4. The game uses tank control movement. Both moving and looking around are on the same stick, and you alternate between them by holding the right trigger. Holding the left trigger will allow you to lock onto targets for automated aiming, and allows you to strafe while locked on. This layout is very comfortable and intuitive to me, though I do think that it's fair for someone to be frustrated if they're used to a more modern control scheme with dual analog aiming. Metroid Prime Remastered offers so many control options and different control schemes. Prime Remastered has an approximation of the Wii controls, classic tank controls, dual analog, and a classic and gyro hybrid. I love it when games offer a variety of control schemes and customization options, and Prime Remastered is excellent for adding all of these options. The control layouts themselves are intuitive, but the actual movement in-game is also great as well. Samus jogs at a speed that fits the amount of space in the levels well. Movement is responsive, but traversal is slower when compared to that of the 2D Metroid titles. I think this is acceptable because of the game's new first-person perspective. Charging around in first-person at Super Metroid speed would be nauseating here. Some version of a run button might have been nice, but no such option exists in Prime. Especially with the remaster, Metroid in 3D is comfortable and intuitive for everyone. The Morph Ball offers a new third-person camera perspective and weighty movement. The ball carries momentum that makes it feel heavy. The game has many morph ball areas that place the camera in a fixed location, which helps you see everything you need to. I appreciate that Retro was able to make moving this ball around in a 3D space feel so intuitive and seamless. If I had any nitpicks, I'd like the ability to use the C-Stick to control the camera. As is, you can use the left trigger to center the camera in the direction that the ball is facing. There's no feedback from the game, so I'm willing to bet that many people didn't know that you could do this. The game is always really good at giving you visual or audio feedback whenever you press any button on the controller but not so much here. Another nitpick that I have is with the boost ball. Getting enough height on the half pipes can be counterintuitive because tilting the analog stick will actually slow you down. To get the boost ball to work properly, you must not tilt the analog stick. Hardly a big deal, but it is counterintuitive. Beyond those two minor gripes, I can't think of a more ideal way to introduce the morph ball into the third dimension. The jumping in this game fares quite well, all things considered. Your jump is a pretty standard video game jump with a predictable trajectory. You can't physically see your player character in first person, but it's clear that the level designers made the world with this limitation in mind. Platforming is mostly done across horizontal planes in this game to complement the camera placement. The vertical platforming segments rarely ask you to do much more than a simple jump, which accommodates this new z-axis and first person perspective well. Platforming sometimes involves additional challenges to vary the gameplay. Such examples include enemies trying to knock you down, placing a time limit on the platforms, invisible platforms, or making the platforms move. Later in the game, your jump is upgraded with a double jump ability. Replacing the high jump from the 2D games better suits the 3D gameplay, because you get that extra chance to make further adjustments to your positioning. One thing that feels like a considerable step down is the absence of the wall jump ability from Super Metroid. This means that the game lacks the sequence breaks that Super allowed through wall jumping. But we'll get more into that later in the video. Even if this was born out of necessity, its absence still detracts from your opportunity to experiment and spice up your platforming. As is the case with every Metroid game that isn't Super, the there is no dynamic momentum with your movement in this game either. As discussed in my Fusion video, I see this as a largely inconsequential loss in practice. As far as I'm concerned, Metroid Prime translates the jumping and platforming from the 2D games masterfully into the third dimension. Talon 4 was once recognized as a biological paradise according to the description found in-game. This planet features a wide array of biomes, with a strong presence of a variety of flora and fauna. This planet was once home to a colony of Chozo, and their remnants can be found all over the many levels of the game world. I'll provide a brief synopsis of each level in order of appearance. Aesthetically speaking, the Frigate Orpheon space vessel is visually interesting, with contrasting colors, with a cold blue and a bright orange being used throughout. Corpses and destruction are visible in nearly every room. Escape pods have been jettisoned hours ago. Little remains of the space pirates here. This place feels unsettling and makes for an intriguing hook to start the game. There's a persistent feeling of something dangerous lurking around every corner. Tension building until you finally get that satisfying payoff with the Parasite Queen. 
and your daring escape. The Talon Overworld is a lush and green rainforest area. Ponds, puddles, and waterfalls are common. A soft rain leaves droplets on your visor. Many rooms show signs of intelligent life once settled on the planet, with stone walls carved into the landscape. The strong presence of wildlife, as well as the overgrown and aged look to the structures, suggests that the Chozo that had once lived here have been long gone. Especially with the whimsical music playing, this level serves as an intriguing area to start your journey on Talon 4. The Talon Overworld will always stand out to me as something uniquely special. After the tense feeling of Frigate Orpheon, this area cleanses your palate with a serene tranquility. Natural and unnatural structures seem to be one of the same in such a way that it makes it difficult to draw a line between the two. There's an air of stillness to the Chozo Ruins. It's apparent that this place has seen decades of decay. The Chozo Ruins appears to have been meticulously built so that the plant life of the area is still able to flourish. Acid runs through nearly every room, as does some form of plant life. Various rooms were once dedicated to specific functions, such as a reflecting pool for meditation, a furnace, a burn dome for waste disposal, energy generators, water pumps, an arboretum, or various fountains. It's interesting to try to imagine what this place once looked like in its heyday. Many rooms are amongst the widest and most open that you'll find on Talon 4, with lots of sunlight from the sky, though a select few areas in this level will also be cramped and dim, tilted as though the entire room is sinking into the sand. The moody lighting of the remaster in particular really gives this place a melancholic liminality. The Magmore Caverns is the level of all time. This place is perhaps my least favorite level in the game for several reasons. I feel that the aesthetic, while not as strong as the rest of the game, is still pretty alright for a level theming of lava caves. Some parts of this level contain geothermal machinery that appears to pump the lava, likely a source of energy for the space pirates, since they are revealed to have a presence on Talon 4. The only real presence that the Chozo seem to have here is this one room with the Chozo statue, which barely tells us what the Chozo did in the Magmore Caverns. I like how entering the Magmore Caverns from the Chozo ruins will have the first few rooms bleed slowly from one aesthetic to the other. Near this one elevator, you can see vines growing down from above to blur the Talon overworld and Magmore Caverns together. Magmore is connected to nearly every level of the game, and I really like how most of the the elevators indicate the presence of neighboring levels in interesting ways. A few rooms seem to contain various kinds of industrial equipment, such as steam exhaust pipes, magma cooling pumps, a small research outpost, or deployable walkways. These set pieces are appreciated, but Magmore Caverns seems undercooked both in aesthetic and storytelling. There is barely anything to scan in the environment, no bosses, only two items that aren't expansions or artifacts, little enemy variety, and little variation from any one room to another. Maybe if there was just a bit more going on, I'd have more positive things to say. The Fendrana Drifts really resonates with me on an emotional level, similarly to how the Talon Overworld and Chozo Ruins do. The Fendrana Drifts is similar to the Chozo Ruins in that there are remains of Chozo temples found peppered throughout the natural landscape. The level uses the the Chozo settlement and cold climate theming to build interesting environmental set pieces like frozen ponds, natural ice formations, soft snow, stalactites, and caves. The Fendrana Drifts has an incredible variety on offer. The level's northern region has a large Chozo temple on a cliff with platforming and light puzzle solving. Then a little further down, you have remains of other Chozo structures built around natural stone formations, with lots of detail in the frozen aesthetic. Beyond that, you have the Fendrana on a pirate lab. The lab is often dark and suffocating, with enemies around every corner. The set pieces and lore in this area give the pirates way more depth than they ever had before, and it serves to add that extra layer of terror once you realize just how gruesome their operations are. The fully built and maintained metallic constructions and wealth of research equipment like computers and holding capsules paint a picture of significant efforts being made for their phase on research. On the other side of Lab Hydra is a region often referred to simply as Southern Fendrana Drifts. This is a late game area that houses more dangerous enemies and features many large open rooms with vast coves, and even a few more remnants of the Chozo. I especially like how this area shows that those familiar S-shaped tunnels have collapsed and been flooded. Fendrana Drifts also has plenty of ice variants of creatures that you've already seen, like the Shriekbat, Burrowers, or Beetles. I think that despite this being a blatant reuse of assets, it's interesting to see these familiar enemies in a new way. Fendrana Drifts has a 
ton of variety in aesthetics, moment to moment gameplay, music, lore, enemies, and layout. Absolutely a highlight of the entire game. Eventually, you can access the Sunken Frigate Orpheon from the beginning of the game. The serene music and somber atmosphere of this place is perhaps the most memorable water level in any game I've played, at least aesthetically. There's something about flooded areas in video games that makes them so uniquely interesting and unnerving to explore. This potential for atmosphere is especially well executed here with the pirate frigate. You'll mostly be platforming around and encountering these aqua reaper vines making their new home here. Their scan says that they are part of a larger submerged organism which I still like to speculate about even all of these years later. The way these guys and the aqua sacs appear throughout the frigate shows that this vessel has been taken back by nature, an aesthetic that I can never get enough of, especially in Metroid. The pirates are apparently salvaging what they can from the shipwreck, so you'll encounter aqua variants of the flying pirates and drones here as well. I like that the presence of the pirates is perfectly in line with their characterization. They're not necessarily here to help the injured that managed to survive, they're here salvaging equipment on the inside. The phase on mines is the last of the main levels, and as a result, it's the greatest challenge of the game. The first segment of the phase on mines is mostly rocky terrain with space pirate research and mining equipment housed underground. Especially compared to the rest of the planet, this place feels very industrial. Equipment like terminals and capsules are frequent, as are the pirates themselves. Security presence is strong in the phase on mines, with force fields, turrets, and powerful troopers. You'll also discover the results of Project Helix in the form of the elite pirates seeing firsthand the devastating effects of Phazon. Of course, Phazon carries a strong presence throughout this level. The depths of the Phazon mines feature large open caves absolutely filled with Phazon which will instantly kill any pirate that makes contact with it. The bright blues of the Phazon contrasts nicely against the dark browns of the caves and industrial metallic surfaces. The Phazon is so bright compared to most everything else, it looks so alien and dangerous in the best way. One detail I really like is this ambient noise that can play whenever you're near Phazon. You can hear what sounds like a Geiger counter in certain rooms, which is a great ambient touch. There are several elevators in this level where you can see the impact crater from below. Just like those similar instances in the Magmore Caverns, this helps make the world feel more connected, like a real world location more than just a video game level. The Phazon Mines is rich with lore, and the aesthetics and environmental design are all top notch. Talon 4, as a whole, is a favorite for many, and the third dimension adds a real sense of place to this world that makes it all the more memorable. Though I think it's often derivative and unoriginal when compared to most other Metroid games, I still think it succeeds at being a compelling world to explore every inch of. Retro Studios, even from the very start, has a unique ability to captivate players with compelling art to paint a memorable game world. Much like their Donkey Kong Country games, they manage to make their worlds endlessly interesting even when relying on familiar tropes just by injecting so much character into their worlds. Environmental design in general has never been done better than the Prime Trilogy, in my opinion. Only the Silent Hill games compare to the incredible art direction on offer in these game worlds, and Prime 1 is certainly no exception. As much as I love the art of the 2D Metroid games, the 3D space and strong art direction of the Prime games gives everything a tangible sense of place and this elevates the experience with the game world as a whole. Any game would be lucky to make a world half as interesting as Talon 4. For all of Metroid Prime's other excellent achievements, I think I continue to replay this game simply because I enjoy existing inside of its incredible game world. As far as I'm concerned, the very best part of this game is just absorbing the atmosphere of Talon 4. This game runs at a mostly consistent 60 frames per second. The game's many rooms all have complex geometry and detailed textures, so much so that it's difficult to believe that this game is running on the GameCube looking the way that it does. Some textures here and there can look dated, but overall this game has to be one of the best looking games of the 6th generation. The reason that the game is able to look so ridiculously detailed is because, at one time, the game only ever loads rooms within your immediate proximity. If you take a look at the game's map, you'll notice that this 
game features many S-shaped hallways between its larger rooms. The game places morph ball tunnels and extra hallways throughout the whole world to allow the game to seamlessly load the larger rooms without the player noticing. These tunnels mostly look the same and often have nothing or just a few enemies designed to slow you down, such as the scatter bamboos or scarabs, so they quickly become pretty uninteresting. These many repeated S-shaped tunnels are one of my only complaints about the art direction in the game world because of how incredibly basic and samey most of them are. It seems that occasionally these hallways don't completely mask the loading times on their own either. Sometimes before entering a larger room, you have to wait a little bit before the door opens. This isn't terribly common, and it doesn't last very long, so I consider the trade-off to be more than worth it for the game's impressive visuals. If you're playing the remaster, then this is easily the best looking Metroid game, period. Just look at this game. Modern high definition graphics with all kinds of visual effects I couldn't possibly name. The remaster adopts a similar philosophy to the original, relatively lower quality textures in fair of higher detail models, but with all kinds of baked in lighting and visual effects. The graphical presentation of this game is so ridiculously good that I think this footage speaks for itself. Load times are also massively improved from the GameCube version. You'll never be stuck at a door waiting. Especially with this remaster, I'm left at a loss for words with how ridiculously good this game looks. It's incredibly difficult for me to overstate the sheer beauty of the art in this game. Prime attempts a more realistic art direction, but this game also has a ton of fantastical set pieces that are often seen in Metroid games. The game shows us fantastic aliens and structures depicted in a relatively realistic manner. Even floating platforms will have some in-universe explanation in the form of jet propulsions, for example. It's clear that the developers were careful to achieve this balance of grounded fantasy, and it's especially impressive when you consider that this detailed world was running on the GameCube. The world of Metroid Prime consists of five main levels, each of which represent a completely unique biome and idea. Talon 4's areas can be placed into typical video game level themes such as ice, jungle, fire, and desert levels. Each of these levels contain interesting environmental set pieces such as various alien structures, a sunken spaceship, a geothermal power station, frozen coves, space pirate laboratories, and more. Many of Prime's ideas have a lot in common with Super Metroid. Prime borrows lots of ideas and iconography like many enemies, bosses, level concepts, and music from Super. In developer interviews, Retro Studios tech lead Jack Matthews described the developers' mindsets about referencing Super Metroid in Prime, saying they considered Prime as Super Metroid reimagined in 3D. I get why they did this for the first 3D Metroid back in 2002 but here in 2024, I can't appreciate it the same way. I see this as similar to The Force Awakens reusing the Death Star idea after over 30 years. It makes sense to borrow iconography from the older titles to sell people on your new game, but borrowing those concepts in the first place lessens your work's individuality and makes it feel derivative. So much of this game feels unoriginal to me because of how hard they leaned into Super Metroid. To give them some credit, plenty of these things are made more original with the transition to 3D, such as Ridley's entirely new moveset or the wrecked ship now being the wrecked frigate Orpheon from the beginning of the game. There is plenty to appreciate with what they did here, but I would have preferred for the game to embrace its own identity as separate from Super. One component of the presentation that has seen an especially impressive transformation to 3D is Samus herself. As with every new Metroid game, Samus receives yet another new look. Looking at Prime Samus, it's apparent that the artists are consistent about committing to a more realistic art style. Her bulkier, shinier armor is definitely one of my personal favorites of her many looks. Since the game is in first person, you won't be seeing the full suit much beyond cutscenes and such here and there. Even considering, Prime does manage to take full advantage of its new first person perspective, especially when it comes to presentation. You get a better look at Samus's arm cannon than ever before, which allows you to see unique animations and details, like Samus's hand matching the symbols of each beam weapon. Samus may recoil or raise her arm after taking damage, or she might stumble for a brief moment after falling a great distance. She sways as she walks and steadies her arm cannon when aiming, and she raises her arm forward when locked on. Certain light sources will allow you to briefly see Samus's reflection within the helmet. Everyone knows about these by now, but I don't think these details can be praised enough. It's all of these little details that come together to elevate Prime's presentation as a whole. 
Metroid Prime has many short cutscenes that play often. If a scan tells you that a force field is deactivated, for example, then you're gonna have to watch a cutscene of that force field deactivating. If a door unlocks, you're getting a cutscene. Every single boss is introduced with a cutscene, and every boss death is played out in a cutscene. Even the little things are shown to you in a cutscene. Plenty of things I don't think a player could possibly miss. There are a ridiculous number of cutscenes for every last little thing changing in the environment. It is true that some of these cutscenes could be necessary in order to properly communicate something missable and important to the player. In a 3D game, it's harder to account for all of the different ways a player could be looking. It could be all too easy to miss something. But even considering that, I still think the sheer frequency of these cutscenes comes with a number of problems. One thing I like about a game like Half-Life is that the game is careful to keep the perspective to the player character's perspective, and allow the player full control of Gordon Freeman during all of your discoveries. Or Doom plays most of its cutscenes from the player character's perspective, and uses cutscenes outside of that perspective sparingly. I don't think it's necessarily bad to take the perspective away from the player, but this feels especially baffling to find this much of it in a game that is so widely celebrated for its immersive qualities. The sequel Prime games similarly use cutscenes fairly often, but they are much more cinematic experiences. The more interesting cinematography makes these breaks in your immersion feel more like a trade-off. Unfortunately, here in Prime, I think these cutscenes are far too frequent and rarely interesting to actually watch. You're kind of stuck with the worst of both worlds when it comes to that trade-off. Samus is pretty stiff and doesn't show very much personality through the animations, especially when compared to basically any cutscene from Echoes or Corruption. The remaster reanimates Samus to look more fluid, but even so, these cutscenes hardly compare to most anything from the sequels, in my opinion. My other issue with these cutscenes, especially the scenes introducing new enemies or bosses, is that taking control away from the player for a discovery will necessarily lessen the impact of that discovery. I praised Super and Fusion for allowing the player to maintain control of Samus during many of the discoveries, which, as I went over, further connects the player by making them an active participant in the investigative process. Metroid Prime will take control away from you to show you something, and I think this changes the way the player feels about that discovery. The cutscene to introduce Metroids, for example, is a cutscene that I believe the game would be better without. Imagine how much scarier it would be if this she-goth appeared during gameplay, rather than during a cutscene. You'd be forced to react to that surprise on the fly, rather than have a sweeping camera shot outline that discovery for you. There is a metric ton of this throughout Metroid Prime. This is the opposite of immersive, and I don't find the cinematography interesting enough to make up for that loss. Sometimes it feels like the game is dying to show you another cutscene over and over. It is important to communicate important information to the player, but I feel like these scenes do not respect my intelligence very much at all. So many of them show you obvious happenings in the world world that anyone could figure out on their own. If they weren't so frequent, or maybe a bit snappier, then I wouldn't mind them as much. What makes it even worse is that very few of these scenes are skippable, and the skippable ones are seemingly random. Many become skippable on repeat playthroughs, but you're required to sit through the majority of them every single time. They might not last more than a few seconds, but these add up quickly and show repeat players information they already know all too well. When the player dies in Prime, the scream that plays is especially unnerving to hear. Far more than the video gamey death sounds to come before in the previous titles, Prime's is more unsettling and visceral. Samus herself will also sometimes grunt when falling or taking damage. Most of the sound effects are tremendously satisfying and feel so perfectly sci-fi and Metroid. Each beam has a unique sound for firing, being charged, and firing a charge shot. Lots of the sounds have a nice punch to them, and the higher fidelity of the GameCube's sound capabilities helps them feel even more real. Everything from the shattering frozen enemies, the hum of your gunship, the morph ball thud, to the guttural dying roar of a space pirate is so satisfying to my ears. 
the music in the Metroid Prime series is in its own entire ballpark of quality. There is just so much to say about the music of Prime, but I just don't think I'm the guy to do this soundtrack justice in explaining what exactly it does to be some of the best music I've ever heard. I can say that Prime's music, again, commits itself to combining a strong melody with a moody atmosphere, with instrumentals that once again connect the listener to the environment. The music will only focus away from the environments for special events such as boss fights, or escape sequences. A select few tracks will forego a melody in favor of atmospheric droning, usually to place focus squarely on unsettling the player. There are so many outstanding tracks in this game that I can't go over all of them without massively inflating the length of this video, but I'll at least mention a few favorites. The title screen and credits music are the two very best tracks in the game, in my opinion. This is seriously the best credits music ever. The two Talon Overworld tracks are my favorite level themes in the game. I'm not particularly fond of the Magmar Caverns theme or Fendrana Battle, but I'm definitely in the minority on that because both of those are fan favorites. All of the boss music tracks are fantastic, but a personal favorite of mine is the Hive Mechas theme. Each level track is well suited to its environment, with instrumentation that reflects something about the level. Fendrana uses this droplet sound, which makes me think of droplets hitting a perfectly still body of water. It's a nice little touch that reflects the natural stillness of Fendrana. My lackluster musical vocabulary prevents me from being more specific, but the Phase on Minds track excellently parallels the feeling of the space pirates waiting around every corner.
The somber and serene harp instrumentation of the Chozo Artifact Temple captures the otherworldly mystery of these missing Chozo. I've barely scratched the surface of the incredible offering found within Prime's soundtrack, but the takeaway is that Prime has one of the very best soundtracks of the series. Despite all of this, I have also found tremendous enjoyment in turning off the game music in Metroid Prime. Prime lets you adjust the music volume, and playing the game without any music is a really interesting and atmospheric experience. As great as all of the music is, I think Prime is so loud and energetic that it can sometimes take away from the the darker undertones of the atmosphere. Since the game also offers the option to turn the music off, I can wander areas like the Chozo Ruins with nothing but diegetic sound effects. I've more recently been into playing Prime this way, and I think everyone should consider trying this out. Games like Dark Souls and Silent Hill have shown me how incredibly effective silence can be in enhancing the atmosphere. My one issue is that I wish there was some way to only have the music that relates to specific events, such as escape music, boss music, pirate battles, and item fanfares. Wait immediately. Evacuate immediately. Evacuate immediately. If I had the option to have only those tracks, but then also keep the level tracks completely silent, I think that'd make for an incredible optional listening experience with Prime. Aside from that nitpick of Lost Potential, I think it's easy for me to say that Prime's music is my favorite of the games I've discussed so far, my second favorite soundtrack of the Metroid series, and my third favorite video game soundtrack of all time. To lay out the basic premise of the story, Metroid Prime is an interquel wherein Samus tasks herself with investigating space pirate activity on planet Talon 4, a meteor containing a highly dangerous semi-sentient radioactive substance called Phazon has struck a seemingly extinct Chozo colony decades ago. The space pirates have covertly deployed science teams to Talon 4 to establish mining and research facilities to learn the potential of Phazon. Samus conveniently picks up on a distress signal originating from a space pirate research vessel orbiting Talon 4, and you spend the game slowly unraveling the mystery and putting a stop to the space pirates' Project Helix an effort to infuse space pirate embryos with Phazon to make incredible super soldiers. Much of what I've discussed here is actually laid out in the first few rooms of the game. Metroid Prime tells the bulk of its story through epistolary scan logs, which are placed all over the game world. There is so much information, in fact, that my synopsis here hardly covers the wealth of information available to read up on during your journey on Talon 4. I can't talk about Prime's story very much without also bringing up the scan visor. The scan visor is in AI equipped within Samus's power suit that, as the name suggests, allows the player to scan objects of interest denoted by this symbol. Upon completing a scan, the game will provide an analysis of the object in question. The scan visor has various functions, such as encrypting space pirate data, translating Chozo and other languages, hacking into security systems, and analyzing things of interest. Though many scans are written from the perspective of different factions of the game world, the majority of scans are written from the perspective of some vaguely defined archive of data. In the later Prime games, it is suggested that the Scanvisor's AI has access to Galactic Federation databases, possibly among other sources of information. This explains why the Scanvisor is able to provide such a detailed wealth of information about all of the creatures in any Prime game. It doesn't explain how how the scan visor could possibly know about something previously unknown, such as the Chozo ghosts, but I speculate that the AI's information also comes from analysis of the data obtained in the scan, such as physiological, contextual, and anatomical data. In addition to the lore dumps and required functions, the scan visor can also provide the player with hints on how to overcome a puzzling obstacle. For example, scanning a cracked wall can tell the player that the wall is composed of a sandstone material. On its own, this doesn't mean much, but if you check the inventory screen, you'll see that bombs can break sandstone. 
I think the scan visor is easily Prime's greatest innovation to the series. The scan visor, the slower movement, and the pacing in general shift focus away from the fast-paced gameplay of the 2D Metroid games, and makes Prime its own beast with a unique and equally valid flavor of Metroid. The scan visor is the best part about Metroid Prime for many people, and I can absolutely see why. Epistolary storytelling is nothing new for video games, not even in the year 2002. The survival horror genre had been enjoying the storytelling device for a good few years, and countless modern games far outclass the sheer quantity and quality of Prime scan logs. With that said, Prime scan logs remain unique for being largely the only way that you receive your story, and the commitment to writing about every last inconsequential thing in the world. Prime's story is not supplemented by the scan logs, it basically is the scan logs. The fun of a story like Metroid Prime's is that you are tasked with seeking out the individual pieces and fitting them together to make sense of the story. This is comparable to something like Dark Souls. These two games are often compared for their similar storytelling methods, and I think each game takes a slightly different approach that better suits their greater design goals. Dark Souls will have some important lore written into the description of a seemingly random rare drop or expensive armor set that doesn't necessarily match your character build. Dark Souls is a much more community-driven game with online mechanics like summoning, invading, and messages. I think more cryptic storytelling works well for encouraging the community to come together to make sense of the lore. Maybe you didn't play an intelligence build, but your friend that did could tell you about some cool lore that they read in the description of their boots. I learned a lot of lore in the Souls games, not from actually playing the games, but talking about the games with my friends back in high school. For all of Dark Souls' merits, I think Prime still offers its own take on this scattered epistolary storytelling that allows it to remain special even in the modern era. I think Prime's self-sustaining epistolary storytelling perfectly complements Metroid's design goals. A major design goal of the entire Metroid series is isolation and player agency. Prime's own version of epistolary storytelling is certainly puzzle-like, but the player is well-equipped to put all of the pieces together themselves. There are no rare drops, no character class customization affording specific armor sets, and no covenants. It makes perfect sense that Metroid Prime would allow all of the pieces of its story to come together within just a single playthrough. Prime's logbook is much more accessible in that all you need to obtain the scans is locate these monitors in the labs or glyphs on the walls to obtain the information. You'd have your work cut out for you if you wish to take a deep dive into this story, but everything that you'd need is already available to you right there in that one playthrough of the game itself. Another thing worth appreciating about Prime's logbook is that you are reading words written by actual characters in the universe. These logs are contextualized as space pirate computer log entries or hieroglyphic writing on the walls of the Chozo ruins. The space pirates and the missing Chozo have very different perspectives on many happenings in the world of Prime, and this is reflected in all of their writing. One example would be the way that these two factions choose to view Phazon. The Space Pirates consistently describe the Phazon as some kind of incredible opportunity. They go on about how these are glorious times for the Space Pirates, that their efforts on Talon IV is the key to their ascension as galactic rulers. The Chozo, on the other hand, refer to Phazon as the Great Poison. The Chozo see Phazon as a devastating horror, one they are desperate to contain, a spreading evil that threatens threatens their very existence. Talking about the incredible wealth and depth of Metroid Prime's writing would probably take me hours, so I'm going to have to end the discussion of the writing itself here to keep this video moving. Even though these two perspectives are fairly one note on their own, it's interesting to see them come together to offer such an interesting wealth of characterization to the factions of the Metroid universe. I think the key word there is characterization, because Metroid Prime's plot is actually remarkably simple. Much of the discussion discussions surrounding Metroid Prime scan logs are focused on fleshing out the characters of the story more than adding to the actual plot itself. There is a huge difference between plot and lore, and I think Metroid Fusion and Metroid Prime are each great examples of how to handle these different priorities. I mentioned in my video on Fusion that the writers were able to tell a complicated and evolving plot, something no epistolary story could ever do, and I think that Metroid Prime's writers seem to agree with me in this regard. Metroid Prime's writers seemed well aware of the strengths and the limitations that come with their chosen method of storytelling. They focus so much on detailed lore and so little on an involved plot that it maximizes the potential of this narrative tenfold. 
the writing of Metroid Prime is one of the most celebrated things about this game, and I do not hesitate to cast my vote with the popular opinion. This is one of Prime's greatest achievements, and Prime 1 in particular deserves praise for how little it relies on cutscenes and exposition to tell its story. The game does have plenty of cutscenes, but few of these have any actual storytelling in them. It's really interesting to see how the Prime games handle blending different types of storytelling methods to communicate their narratives, because different amounts and types lead to stories with unique strengths and weaknesses. Prime 1, committing so hard to using only the skin scan visor makes using that scan visor so much fun. There is something special with how Prime 1's entire story is made of these puzzle pieces. The only game that similarly uses the scan visor to tell so much of its story would probably be Prime Hunters, which deserves similar praise. I give the edge to Prime 1 for offering multiple perspectives within its narrative, whereas with Hunters, you really only get the perspective of the Alembics. I'll save the discussion on that for its own video, but Prime 1 has way more logs that I think are just more interesting to read as well. I think that Prime 1's writing in particular is special when compared to Echoes or Corruption, because those games opt to rely on more traditional storytelling methods for a larger portion of their narratives, and this lessens the efficacy of their scan logs in relation to the main plot. There's not as much to piece together when characters like Umas or Admiral Dane are there to just tell you exactly what's going on. Those stories offer their own wealth of interesting lore to supplement the main plot, and it's all great stuff that, again, I'll get into with their own videos, but Prime 1 does something unique with committing fully to that idea of giving the player full agency in their narrative experience. Metroid Prime is celebrated for having the very best environmental storytelling not only in Metroid, but just amongst video games in general. World building, immersion, environmental storytelling. These phrases come up all of the time when fans are talking about their favorite things about Metroid Prime. Environmental storytelling has been handled well in the Metroid series so far, and I recognize that Metroid Prime does this tremendously well in a lot of ways. I'll first discuss what I really like about this aspect of Prime, and then get into where I see room for improvement. Every single thing that has anything to do with the space pirates is so ridiculously interesting and well done. The Frigate Orpheon, the Pirate Lab in Fendrana, all of the different things to see in the Phazon Mines, all of this is trademark Metroid environmental storytelling. The characterization of the space pirates in the scan logs is excellently synchronized with what we see in their research and mining facilities. Before you even scanned anything in biohazard containment on the frigate Orpheon, you can just take a look around and gather so much from the environment. All of these containment chambers house a variety of creatures, one of which is enraged even still all of these hours later. That's not natural, something is seriously wrong with that creature for it to still be pounding on that door. The giant tank in the middle is surrounded by different monitors, and you can clearly see multiple tubes for pumping something into the tank. The corpse is completely decayed, especially around its stomach and esophagus. What the hell did this thing eat or breathe for it to die this way? What could the pirates be doing with these poor creatures? This is just one room in the beginning of the game but it does so much to paint a specific picture with what the pirates are up to. Even before that, in the emergency evacuation area, you're painted a fairly self-explanatory but interesting scene. This giant corpse is leaking acid out of its mouth. Bodies litter the floor. All escape pod chambers are empty. Tiny versions of the huge monster are feeding and scurrying across the floor. I could be here all day if I were to try to discuss every room but the pirate labs on Talon 4 keep this trend going with all kinds of lab equipment, strange remains of what appear to have once been space pirates, metroids kept in cold containment. Even one room has a local fish placed out for one pirate's meal. There is just so much to see and appreciate with how the space pirates were characterized and how their presence in the story was told through not only the scan logs, but also the environment. This synchronicity between the environmental and epistolary storytelling makes for some of the most interesting storytelling in any game I've ever played. I think there is much to appreciate about the Chozo in a similar manner. 
Their homes are absolutely covered in sand, similar to how I described the sand found in Return of Samus's Chozo ruins. But the Chozo of Talon 4 are strongly characterized by their apparent harmonization with nature. From your initial planetfall, the familiar blue doors of Metroid are immediately found. Similar to Metroid NES, you can find alien-made structures built right into the natural environment. Talon Canyon shows a smooth carving built right into this room, though its function is unclear. The bridge above Above is made of trees, but these trees are not cut. They are grown sideways. The trees, vines, and sapsacks are still thriving here. This is comparable to what we saw with Planet Zebus, but it's interesting that there's a specific commitment to preservation here. Fast forward to the home of the Chozo, what we know only as the Chozo ruins, and this pattern is consistent with what we saw before. The Chozo carefully built their bridges around the trees here. Decorative sandstone is infused with metallic supports, but everything seems carefully constructed to allow plant life to continue to thrive. Take the ruined nursery, a room wherein this tree has been carefully preserved and remains in direct sunlight. The Chozo went through meticulous effort to keep this tree here, and I think that says a lot about the Chozo. The space pirates are foils to the Chozo, opposites in nearly every way. The pirates consistently show an utter disregard for preservation, a disregard for life, focusing only on results and practical application. The Chozo are the polar opposite, showing an incredible commitment to preservation of all life. So much of their home is decorated with a variety of plant life and architecture. This rigid dichotomy between the two major characters of Metroid Prime makes for a compelling characterization, and I think that's part of what makes Metroid Prime so special. While I think that the story of the Space Pirates is well told even without the scans, I also feel that the story of the Chozo relies too heavily on the scan visor. The environments do not go near far enough in effectively communicating the story of the Chozo, in my opinion. I feel that the story of the Chozo is entirely missable, if not for the scan visor. So much of what the Chozo describe in their lore entries is basically non-existent in the environments. For example, the Chozo spend a lot of time talking about the Phazon infection spreading throughout their planet, and the devastating consequences of it. The Phazon spread is described as a spider weaving its web, seeping deep into the planet. So much of the devastation of Phazon is is largely unseen on the actual planet. Lines like the Phazon encompassing the surface of Talon 4 in a single night, they really make the Phazon sound like it's this devastating issue. There is virtually no sign of Phazon anywhere on the planet outside of the mines, which feels inconsistent with what the scans describe. There is one single room with Phazon in it that isn't the Phazon Mines, and that's the hallway leading to the Mines Elevator. I suppose that you could make a case for these blue lichen in the Talon Overworld being signs of the spread, but this really does look like just any other plant, even looking like the blue lichen I mentioned previously in Super Metroid. The scan might tell you that there's a low level of radiation, but again, I'm criticizing the environment, not the scan visor here. I find it difficult to believe that Phazon is this world-ending threat corrupting the mines and or killing every creature on Talon 4 if none of it even exists anywhere on Talon 4 beyond these depths right below the crater. Not even the impact crater has any Phazon visible from the outside, which seems baffling to me. Even the floating leviathan buried in this stone shows a bunch of trees sticking out of it, communicating the opposite of a life-ending threat. These trees are thriving here, and they are all growing out of the crater. The scans also mention a force field, which is apparently invisible? There's just no force field visible anywhere, so this only exists in the scans. It's so odd to me that these huge plot points are not only non-existent in the environment, but sometimes feel actively contradictory towards what the logbook describes. The home of the Chozo has absolutely zero phase on anywhere near it, and yet the game wants us to believe that it's completely completely corrupted all of their minds. I am aware of the fact that the Chozo eventually succeeded in containing the source of the Phazon to stop Phazon from spreading any further, but that says nothing of the previously described web of Phazon killing and corrupting creatures by the literal thousands. If this strange energy has encompassed the planet, and there's no further information about what became of all of this Phazon, then it's perfectly reasonable to expect signs of that Phazon in the environments. I find this discrepancy between the environmental storytelling and the epistolary storytelling to be jarring, and I think Prime's environmental storytelling kind of fails at telling a cohesive story. The stuff with the space pirates is great, but 
everything else feels more like characterization than an actual story. Corruption will get its time to shine in its own video, but the planets similarly struck by leviathans in that game do a lot with the environments to show you that the world is being changed. Phazon infused wild animals appear, or scattered splotches of Phazon will grow on surfaces. If the story describes a force field surrounding the leviathan, then you'll be able to physically see that force field. It feels like Prime 1's writers and environment artists weren't on the same page about certain things and it makes for a less compelling story overall, in my opinion. I bring all of this up also because of the reputation surrounding Prime Scan Visor. People defend the Scan Visor by saying that if you don't want to use it, then just don't. My issue with this is that the story doesn't really work without the Scan Visor, and even with the Scan Visor, there are still inconsistencies. For how little of the lore actually matters to the plot of Metroid Prime, it feels like they could have done better to set up the major characters of the story. The origin of the Metroid Prime creature sparks so much debate in the community that some can't even agree that it's a Metroid at all. Fans have created their own theories, such as the one about the Phazon Metroid phasing through the force field, but even these theories each come with their own problems. The wiki page of the Metroid Prime has its own entire section dedicated to going over all of the inconsistencies, even with the updated version of the logbook. It feels to me like if they were going to take the time to go this in-depth with all of the lore, they could have at least hinted at a mere possibility for the origin of the Metroid Prime. I can enjoy speculating on unexplained aspects of a story where things are meant to be up for interpretation, but this doesn't feel like that to me at all. Despite the game's incredible commitment to a wealth of lore and characterization, the writers never attempt to even hint at a potential origin of the Metroid Prime. Many fans enjoy taking apparent inconsistencies and crafting their own theories about the story, and I think that's fine, but I don't think we should be going so far as to do the writers' jobs for them and then criticize those who do not accept these theories as canon. It also feels like the writers kinda gave up here in the beginning, with Samus losing her power-ups for such a silly reason. The Metroid series overall is no stranger to writing in consistencies, but Prime in particular shows an explicit disregard for consistency in moments such as these. Previous Metroid games left this kind of thing unanswered, but Prime seems more than okay with just asking you not to think about this stuff too hard. I don't see the writing of Prime as perfectly logically consistent or cohesive, but neither were games like Super. It was awfully convenient that Samus just so happened to pick up on the space pirate distress signal in the middle of seemingly nowhere, but it was also awfully convenient that Samus didn't immediately die when she became infected by the X in Fusion. If you look more closely, then you'll notice all kinds of writing issues like these in many video game stories. I see the value in pointing out writing issues such as these, but I hardly think these issues even begin to approach ruining the stories of these games. One thing that could bother some players is that the game is pretty vague with what you even manage to accomplish by the end. One scan in the game says that Talon 4 will become a wasteland in as little as 25 years, and this left many with the impression that there is nothing you can do here to change anything. Phazon has already seeped deep into the planet, and it's already killing everything without the help from the sealed impact crater, according to this scan. So I don't really get how destroying the sealed impact crater would make a difference on all of the Phazon that has already spread. It's not until the end of the third game that you even learn that you actually did save Talon 4, though I can't help but wonder how. Corruption doesn't even attempt to explain anything. It just tells you that the planet is healing. I don't like having to wait until the end of game 3 just to learn what I accomplished in game 1. Other aspects of the story similarly end in vague and potentially unsatisfying terms. You failed to save the Chozo. The pirates never needed the impact crater itself to realize the potential of Project Helix, so destroying it doesn't really put a stop to their plans. Samus definitely slowed their progress by killing so many of them throughout the game, but none of the writing ever attempts to even hint towards a tangible conclusion on this plot thread. The pirates already have plenty of Phazon infused soldiers by the time of corruption, so you failed to stop Project Helix, and you failed to actually kill the Metroid Prime. So it feels like your victory on Talon 4 didn't really amount to much of anything. I can see the potential for this story to feel unsatisfying to some for these reasons. The ending is special to me for giving us a memorable, powerful moment of silence with Samus looking over the destroyed impact crater. Once again, Prime seems to prioritize compelling character moments more than telling a properly cohesive story.
I'm sure that viewers will provide plenty of answers for the seemingly contradictory elements of this story, and I think that's fine. With that said, I still don't think Prime's narrative goes far enough in providing the proper pieces for players to play with and speculate on. You really have to stretch your imagination to make this lore even begin to make sense in key areas, such as the origin of the namesake of this entire subseries. Taken on the whole, I think it's clear that the priority of Prime's writing is not so much to stand on its own as an interesting and cohesive story, but instead to task the player with piecing together many scattered segments. The story itself leaves a lot to be desired in execution, but my enjoyment of this writing comes from putting it all together myself as I explore the world. To rewind a bit, I'd like to discuss the scan visor a bit more. Though I do immensely enjoy the scan visor, I do have issues with its implementation and disagreements with its reputation. For one, I wish these smaller orange and red symbols were more clearly visually separated from objects already scanned. They only become slightly faded after being scanned, and it's easy to be unable to tell what you have and have not scanned. The more pressing issue is that the scan visor is often touted as an optional lore and hint tool. Some fans of the Prime series like to say that if you don't like the scan visor, then you can just choose not to use it and you'll be fine. It's just an optional hint and lore tool, right? I think the scan visor ultimately fails to be accommodating towards those that choose not to use it. For one, the scan visor is simply not optional. The game's tutorial indicates that the only time that the scan visor is required is whenever you see this specific symbol in the world. This is all well and good, and the game does stay fairly consistent about this with elevator panels and such using this symbol to indicate those instances in which the scan visor is indeed required. My problem is that it doesn't take very long before before the game breaks its own established rules and starts requiring the use of the scan visor without this visual signifier. It starts with these runic symbols in the Chozo ruins, wherein you simply will not be able to progress until you give up and decide to use the scan visor. If the scan visor really is meant to be an optional hint and lore tool, then a player that deeply values figuring things out on their own is inevitably going to get stuck when the game fails to communicate the necessity of the scan visor. In the Fendrona Drifts, there's this hidden panel that absolutely needs to be scanned to unlock a nearby door. It's all too easy for a player committing to not using the optional hint and lore tool to falsely conclude that they are simply missing some item. This player is sent on a fool's errand, searching for an item that doesn't exist. Without the signifier indicating the requirement of the scan, there is no reason for the player to think that they'd be required to use the scan to proceed. If they just slapped their symbol on this panel, or on those runic symbol walls, then I wouldn't have a problem. The game then continues to break its established rule repeatedly by continuing to obfuscate this symbol in several instances. You need to scan three different monitors in a large room filled with monitors to unlock the thermal visor. Once again, someone not using the scan visor is likely to falsely conclude that they need to return here with some new power-up to break the barrier, or perhaps return here with the ice beam to go through the door. In the phase on mines, the game will again numerous times just refuse to follow the rule the tutorial established and require you to to use the scan visor on inconspicuous set pieces. Metroid Prime is conditioning players to depend on its scan visor with its repeated obfuscation of required scan node signifiers. Additionally, the removal of these item icon tiles from the 2D games necessarily places dependence on the scan visor to provide more information about destructible objects. A player used to be able to bomb or missile a block to reveal how to destroy it, but now you may not even realize something can be destroyed at all unless you scan it. This particular Cordite object found a few times in the game is a great example of something that can feel inconspicuous in this detailed world, something a player committing to not using the scan visor could easily mistake for yet another common piece of decorative architecture. The problem is that Prime's commitment to immersion is fundamentally changing the dynamic between the player and the world. You aren't investigating with your bombs, power bombs, and missiles anymore, you're instead equipping the scan visor to search for hidden scan nodes. As a result, the game is going to show you giant nodes on nearly every destructible object, and scanning will just spell the answer out for you, regardless if that's what you wanted or not. Because remember, the game has taught you that inconspicuous parts of the environment can turn out to be vital to your progression. The game outright requires the scan visor far too often to claim that the scan visor is just an optional hint and lore tool. As a result, investigating the environment has fundamentally changed from observing subtleties within the environment to instead spotting the 
these nodes and reading about what to do. You can attempt not to use it and see how far you'll get without it and mostly be okay, but those numerous instances in which the game punishes you for choosing not to use the scan means that you're inevitably going to use it anyway, just in case to avoid yet another fool's errand. Any dead end could feature a hidden required scan, and you won't know unless you check. Especially for newcomers, this inconsistency makes you second guess dead ends by looking them over with the scan visor. Metroid Prime wants to be a game about exploration and player-driven discovery, but conditioning the player to rely on the scan visor for required progress disrupts this dynamic. Agency is de-emphasized by this scan visor text flatly telling you exactly what to do instead of the player making the effort themselves to identify the location of secrets. I would be completely okay with the scan visor doing this if it were consistently optional, because then it would fulfill a similar purpose to the x-ray scope or scan pulse. The way these mechanics come together is harmful to player discovery in the name of benefiting immersive qualities in the world. It feels like Prime is conflicted with its priorities in this instance, and its scan visor fully satisfies neither design goal and practice. My other issue with the scan visor comes from its function as both an optional hint and lore tool. Let's say I'm deeply interested in reading the lore of Metroid Prime, but I do not want any hints given to me or any secrets revealed. I'd prefer to discover those on my own. Prime scan visor forces you to accept both the lore and the hand holding. You can't just pick one or the other. If you want only the lore, you also have to accept the hints. If you want only the hints, you also have to accept the lore. Even reading about cool bosses to learn about them, you'll likely be told about how to defeat them in their logbook entry. Even just equipping the scan visor to look around for interesting lore will highlight secret destructible tiles you may not have known about. A huge part of secret searching for me personally is that I like to see if I can pick up on more subtle clues in the environment, and investigate the situation myself to see if I can solve the problem on my own. If I I come across something that looks interesting in the environment and I want to read about its lore, I am forced to also reveal those secrets that I didn't want to be flatly told about. Even just seeing the scan node gives away the presence of a secret, whether you wanted to see that or not. This really bothers me because I'm not satisfied with having to choose between having both handholding and lore or having neither. I think Prime 4 needs to change the implementation of this system to fully realize the appeal and potential of the scan visor. One solution that I could imagine is that they could have a certain button toggle highlighting the hints on and off. Maybe secret destructible areas could be highlighted in a unique color, and they're only visible if you decide to press that button to reveal them. Making hints a toggle would pretty much fix this entire issue, and I'd love to see Prime 4 do something like this to allow players, like myself, to experience the game just how we wanted. So all of this is to say that Metroid Prime's scan visor, while still largely an excellent addition to the series with a profound impact on the entire game experience, is not accommodating toward those who do not care to use it. Metroid Prime is the kind of game where you're going to have to either get used to using the scan visor or I think you're going to have a bad time. It's not like you have to go around scanning everything, but like I said, I really cannot agree with its reputation as an optional tool that accommodates all kinds of players. I massively enjoy scanning everything and I already know about all of the hidden required scans, so this hardly bothers me at all. But I also see numerous issues with the scan visor's implementation. Metroid Prime is a mechanically immersive game. I think Prime's gameplay can be described similarly to what I said about Super Metroid. Prime's gameplay offers tremendously immersive qualities. The freedom to take the logbook entries in at your own pace places the story experience entirely in your hands. You're not forced to listen to exposition or watch cutscenes, you're piecing things together yourself. The scan logs flesh out the world as a believable space, painting a world with a proper history. Prime goes even further with its item progression, placing even more focus on the world itself as a ball of yarn to be slowly unraveled. The self-driven, freeform exploration gameplay of Prime is just as immersive as it was in Super, only now it's in first person in a proper 3D world. I won't get into too much detail about this here, since I already went in depth on this in my Super Metroid video, but the gameplay of Prime is easily the most immersive thing about it, even more than its first person perspective or 3D detailed world. Prime also commits to keeping nearly everything diegetic, such as the new heads-up display. Displaying all of this as something that Samus herself sees further connects the player to the game world. Metroid Prime goes even further with its first-person perspective by using visual effects to obscure your visor. Fog, lava, alien goop, static, ice, water, and steam 
all hit your helmet's visor in a way that looks visually consistent with how you'd expect fluids to look. In a lot of ways, the immersive qualities of Metroid Prime are profound. At the same time, I can't help but notice the room for improvement within the design of the world itself. When designing levels for the 2D Metroid games, the environments are designed to loosely represent a 3D space. Planet Zebus and the BSL are fully realized 3D areas in-universe, but are represented in a 2D plane. As I went over in my Fusion video, it's easy to suspend your disbelief in this scenario because we accept that this is just the nature of 2D game design. That line between world believability versus interesting level design is blurred with a 2D perspective. So when it came time for Retro Studios to translate Metroid into 3D, they had a number of design challenges to face. How are all of these very gamey floating platforms and such supposed to look in 3D while maintaining that suspension of disbelief? They did go so far to place many of the platforms alongside walls and add in things like pillars and support cables to ground this world in a more believable manner. There are sometimes even floating platforms with jet propulsions keeping them afloat. Upon first glance, Retro seems to be committed to selling you on this world as a believable space. It's no secret that one of the most celebrated things about Metroid Prime is that it's the go-to example for immersive world building. Many take it even further, describing Prime as the pinnacle of immersive game design even to this day. If you're even slightly familiar with the discourse surrounding this game, then you'll likely be aware of the incredible reputation surrounding Metroid Prime's immersive qualities. While I do think that Prime has a lot of mechanical immersive qualities, I also think that the game does plenty of things that harm immersion through its environments. Everything from the gamey set pieces, like the many bomb slots, boost ball spinners, morph ball tunnels, to the many rooms that look way more like video games game areas than they do believable locations, this game is hardly the go-to example for immersive video game worlds, in my opinion. The common excuse is that things like the spiderball tracks, bomb slots, and spinners are all frequently used on Talon 4 because the Chozo also use their power suits to interface with these devices. Even the logic within that excuse doesn't quite add up because that doesn't explain why the space pirates would have so much of their tech utilize Chozo technology. Tech they have explicitly said they cannot replicate. Every time I see one of these things, I have a hard time buying into this world as a believable space. It doesn't matter how influential Chozo technology could be in-universe, when in my real life 9 to 5, I have a button on a keyboard that does the same thing infinitely better than any Morph Ball bomb slot ever could. Even considering this loose in-universe justification, these things still completely shatter my suspension of disbelief. Additionally, so much of Prime's level design is unconcerned with laying out these areas in a believable way in a 3D space. How do you think the pirates actually move through this observatory? There aren't any ramps or stairs, and there's no implication of any means of traversal here. The hallway that leads to their Phazon Caves, a hallway they need to frequent in order to carry out their Phazon mining operations, is just a long morph ball tunnel with collapsing platforms. The other side of the door is high in the air with no stairs, ramps, elevators, anything. Or what about this map station on the frigate Orpheon? How was anyone actually supposed to get in here? It's specifically the fact that the only means of entering this room is the morph ball tunnel. The designers did not draw in any kind of locked or broken door or whatever, so we're forced to conclude that this room was deliberately built with this tunnel as the intended entrance. This room called Research Access, where they need to transport Phazon to Elite Research in order to do their research, is just a giant empty drop-off with a electric spinning rings. There is no implication of any lift, retractable stairs, or elevator. Nothing to contextualize this room as a believable space in the world. This 3D game can't blur the line of believability like the 2D games could, so I find myself asking questions about the environments that I never asked before. There are constant reminders that you are indeed in a video game world that was built specifically for you. And no, I don't think these guys being mysterious aliens is a good enough excuse to make these environments feel immersive or believable. I bring all of this up because of of the sheer quantity and severity of players touting this game as the pinnacle of immersive world design. I can't help but feel like I've more than explained why I simply am nowhere near in agreement with that. 
Prime's world is so transparently a video game world, one that consistently demonstrates that immersive environment design is not a priority. I have a really hard time believing that Talon 4 is anything other than a video game level built specifically for the player, and it's because they do not bother to contextualize so many parts of the world as believable components of the environment. Metroid Prime does offer plenty of rooms that do manage to contextualize their mechanics as part of the world. In the deck beta conduit hall, the designers placed all of this wreckage here to create a morph ball tunnel. The context is that this was once a normal hallway for people to use, but now it's collapsed and only Samus can squeeze through. Or take any of the many rooms with naturalistic cave and plant formations creating platforming opportunities. The frigate access tunnel and transport tunnel C both use trees growing to shape out unique platforming and morph ball opportunities that integrate naturally into the world design. I could even buy the wrecked reactor core, having all of these conveniently floating platforms allowing you to jump around underwater. Instead of actively harming my suspension of disbelief of the environment, these kinds of rooms enhance my immersive experience by being contextually cohesive with the world design. Compare that to something like ore processing, which makes no attempt to be anything other than a gamey set piece. I understand that that adding in stairs could potentially ruin the whole point of these rooms, but even the other Prime games have found ways to contextualize these kind of things to make them more believable. Take Prime 3's room called Broken Lift wherein this broken lift forces you to find another way around. It's the little things like this that really elevate the believability of your game world, and Prime 1's man-made structure areas are constantly disregarding this kind of immersive world building. I don't think that this is any kind of big deal, but I do think it's worth explaining myself clearly about why I don't find the world itself very immersive. Immersion is not the end-all be-all goal of Metroid but it's clear that immersion was a major design goal of the Metroid Prime games. Retro Studios has only become better at designing their environments to be more immersive as they continue to release new games, and I think one look at Tropical Freeze makes this clear. Even a game like Donkey Kong is handled with such tremendous care as a believable and tangible space. Retro has been on an upwards trend since their first game, only getting better and better about building their environments in a believable way. Here in the first Prime game, I can't help but notice the comparatively lacking immersive qualities of Talon 4 itself. It doesn't please me to say it, but Prime just doesn't quite do it for me in this regard, like it seems to for other players. There's a larger discussion to be had about how seriously a game franchise should or shouldn't take building its world as a believable space. Metroid Prime is interesting because it does this very well in some ways, but fumbles in others. When I point out all of these gamey environments, I do so not to criticize the game itself, but more so to challenge the reputation surrounding Prime's immersive qualities. It is something that the sequels would improve on, but whether or not this kind of thing bothers you in the first place is completely up to you. The immersive qualities of this game are still great on the whole through its immersive gameplay, but there are notable issues that prevent me from fully agreeing with Prime's reputation as some kind of immersive sim game. I find myself continuously captivated by the experience of treating the game as a holistic, interconnected world with a detailed history, but I think that this game can't benefit from blurring the lines of environmental belief ability like the 2D games can. I do think this game deserves to be celebrated for its achievements, but I just also see plenty of room for improvement in the environment design. Metroid Prime is made of five main levels. Prime initially seems to be designed with a similar design philosophy to that of Super Metroid, with one level interconnecting all of the other levels. Levels like the Fendron Drifts and Talon Overworld may not be connected directly, but all levels connect to the Magmor Caverns. This makes Magmor somewhat of a super highway between all of the world's levels, similar to Super's Lower Brinstar. There are a number of differences between Lower Brinstar and Magmor Caverns that makes the latter feel like it fails to capitalize on its potential. For one, the general movement abilities of Samus are at a snail's pace compared to their Super Metroid counterparts. Samus cannot run, cannot use the speed booster or a space jump, and there is no wall jumping. The 3D perspective in general necessitates more deliberate movement through a game world, so it's understandable that Prime would place focus on being a slower paced experience. The problem is that it feels like the designers weren't interested in doing much to accommodate for this in the way they 
redesign their world. It actually feels like they did the opposite, going out of their way to slow the player down at every opportunity. Developer interviews reveal that this was very much the case, because Nintendo was concerned that the game would be too short. I also wouldn't be surprised if that was a bit of a game lengthening measure too. So yeah, I, I doubt that anyone would have reasonably put an elevator there. Because mm -hmm. again, we were full of terror that the game was too short. So, <laughs> you know. As discussed earlier, slowing down the player was also a necessary evil of the well-detailed world. Especially with the developers themselves admitting that padding was a massive priority of their game, I think it's fair for me to criticize this design decision even if it does sometimes offer benefits, like the well-detailed geometry. This artificial lengthening of the game is especially apparent in Magmore Caverns in a lot of ways. In addition to the overall slower movement, Magmore also just features a wide array of set pieces that are purposely designed to slow you down or make you wait. Puffers leave behind a cloud of toxic gas. Fire streams force you to stop and wait. Puddle spores force you to wait for their opening. Triclops makes you stop or get carried all the way back. Moving platforms make you wait. There's just so much time wasted in Magmore Caverns. To give the level some credit, about five rooms feature grapple swing hook shortcuts to speed things up. Space jump boots might help you skip this Triclops tunnel and the ice beam can freeze the fire jets. But these opportunities hardly address the greater issue. Being able to bypass some of the waiting doesn't justify the mere existence of these mechanics in the first place, especially with the majority of them being devoid of mechanical substance and repeated ad nauseum. What's even worse is that Magmore Caverns is laid out like one giant straight linear line, deviating only for small rooms with things like expansions, save rooms, or elevators. The level doesn't connect back in on itself in any manner, so there is no opportunity for shortcuts within in Magmore. As a result, backtracking through Magmore often has you retreading the exact same stretch of rooms in the exact same way. This level is one of the most criticized things about this game, and I can absolutely see why. I don't usually mind backtracking, but Magmore Caverns does so much to slow things down to a boring and repetitive crawl. I praised Super and Fusion for offering fresh new routes through their worlds for backtracking, such as with Super's grappling beam area or with Fusion's speed booster area, but Prime barely offers any of this at all. Magmore stands out as one of Prime's greatest weaknesses for dividing so much of the world on different sides of this massive linear line. If you're interested in exploring a different level from the one that you're in, there's a good chance that it's going to cost you yet another mind-numbing trek through Magmore Caverns just to get to that other level. This formula is especially volatile with Prime's general placement of items, which frequently requires you to backtrack through Magmore. To rewind a bit, Talon Overworld is the first level. Looking at a complete map, Talon Overworld is shockingly small. Pathing options are very limited, and this map hardly has any opportunity to expand to a sprawling interconnected web of rooms. It's a basic Y shape with this huge stretch of linear rooms, the Sunken Frigate. This linear stretch only needs to be completed a single time, so it's nowhere near as offensive as something like Magwar Caverns. They put a shortcut that connects this area to the Choza Ruins on the other side of the linear stretch, so you don't have to cross the Sunken Frigate every time you want to get back to this phase on Mine's entrance. The Chozo Ruins is easily the most well-structured level in the game, in my opinion. Like a proper exploration and navigation-focused Metroid game, this level features a good number of branching pathways going every which way. Pathways loop back into each other, and you're given a number of pathing options to consider when attempting to make sense of your navigation. It's the largest and most maze-like level in the game, and thus offers the best navigational challenge of Metroid Prime. An entire chunk of this level cannot be reached until much later in the game, when you obtain the Spider Ball. The Fendron Adrifts isn't quite quite as maze-like as it may initially appear, but it's Prime's second most interconnected level. There are three main chunks of this level, the Chozo Ice Temple, the Pirate Lab, and South Vendrana. The Chozo Ice Temple area is a small interconnected group of rooms that sufficiently tests your navigational skills, and makes for some interesting gameplay. The Pirate Lab, however, is again a nearly entirely straight set of rooms. The only deviations are again save and map stations. And this entire huge stretch of linear rooms must be immediately done a second time backwards, once again, quite the linear stretch of rooms. South Fendrana is another small collection of interconnected rooms, but this area is quite linear in terms of your actual traversal options. Though the rooms may appear as though you have multiple doors to choose from, you can't reach any of these higher rooms, so it's actually quite easy to find your way through. Though to a lesser extent than areas like the Pirate Lab, this kind of world and level design again places focus on a more immediate type of gameplay. The Phazon 
lines, once again, is built in an almost entirely linear fashion. If not for a couple of shortcuts twisting back to earlier areas, this entire level would be one ginormous stretch of a single twisting hallway. So again, there's virtually no navigational challenge offered in the phase on mines through its actual world layout. When you look at Metroid Prime's entire world design more closely, it's shocking just to see how much of this game world is made of entire massive linear stretches of rooms. The Frigate Orpheon, most of Talon Overworld, basically all of Magmore Caverns, the Sunken Frigate, the Phazon Mines, the Impact Crater, and good portions of Fendrana Drifts are all nearly completely straight hallways that offer very little in terms of pathing options within each level. Looking at the world layout as a whole, only parts of Fendrana and basically all of Chozo Ruins seem to offer much of any actual maze-like world layout. Like I've said before, linearity in Metroid isn't necessarily a bad thing, but the thing about this kind of linear world design is that it necessarily places focus away from challenging your navigation in favor of a more moment-to-moment -moment style of gameplay. Things like combat, puzzle solving, and platforming are emphasized as the focus of these kinds of areas. I'll discuss those concepts in their own segments, but as far as the actual world design is concerned, Prime is shockingly linear a majority of the time. How these levels actually connect to each other can still be puzzling even within areas like Magmore Caverns, but this is easily one of the most linear worlds in the entire series. It's still possible to get lost on Talon 4, but this isn't so much from the actual world layout itself. Prime has a lot of trouble with pacing, but there are also segments of the map that feel deliberately built to artificially inflate your time. I already went over the Magmore Caverns, but there are also two instances in particular that feel designed to waste your time. After obtaining the Ice Beam, players have two nearby unexplored doors to choose from. One will take you to a small pocket of Talon Overworld, but I like that it doesn't take too long to realize that this area is a dead end. The other path takes you to the crashed frigate Orpheon. You can go really deep into the sunken frigate, all the way down to this elevator shaft. If you came all this way without the gravity suit, which is likely to happen since it's placed right next to where you got the ice beam, then it takes way too long for the game to communicate that you need an item to proceed. By placing the item check all the way at the end of this slow linear stretch, you're punishing the player for exploring by making them backtrack all the way back up this slow stretch of flooded rooms. A game all about exploration shouldn't be this punishing towards the player just for exploring especially with the game seemingly being designed to funnel the player right to this area. What's worse is that there is a save room placed right next to the deepest part of this underwater dead end, meaning that players that save here can't just reload their save to get back out. Metroid is usually really good about being careful not to waste the player's time, but Prime often shows that it's deliberately interested in doing exactly that. Another example is the part of the game where you reach Metroid Quarantine A, and are required to use the X-ray visor to proceed. My first issue is that this room fails to clearly communicate to the player that they would need a visor to proceed. It's just this huge gap that's too big to jump over. So when players finally do get around to collecting the x-ray visor, they're highly unlikely to make any connection between the x-ray and that phase on pit in the Metroid Quarantine A. What's even worse is that because the phase on mines is built like a giant stretch of linear rooms, you have to trek through the exact same hallways over and over to backtrack to this location. So even when you do finally come down here with x-ray, you're immediately sent backwards to go find the power-up to let you through this red door in the very next room. A big problem with Prime's many long stretches of linear rooms is that navigating back and forth within these areas is repetitive and samey. What's worse in some cases is that the placement of the items only further accentuates the issue by forcing you back and forth for no good reason, such as with the placement of the plasma beam and x-ray visor item checks, or space jump requiring you to backtrack through Magmore Caverns multiple times, or thermal visor requiring you to do the entire lab backwards. World design overall is a notable weak point of Metroid Prime for me, because the placement of elevators and rooms feels like it's deliberately designed to kill pacing just to stretch your final playtime. Areas like most of the Fendrana Drifts, and especially the Chozo Ruins, are well designed with excellent pacing. These are considerable portions of the game, but there are a lot of layouts here that feel quite forgettable to me as well. Metroid Prime, similar to Super Metroid, places focus squarely on item progression. From Planet Fall to the Phazon Suit, your progression is always contingent on your abilities and arsenal. This comes with all of the benefits and drawbacks you'd expect from this approach. Making progress in this world is consistently a methodical and logical process of comparing your moveset and abilities to the different kinds of set pieces within your ever-expanding explorable area. Morph Ball opens opportunities to roll through smaller holes, Missiles blast missile doors, 
space jump boots reach further and higher platforms, and so on and so forth. Those satisfying aha moments from Super Metroid are here in Prime as well, and it's still great stuff. The player is in charge of their own progression, and it makes for an immensely satisfying gameplay loop of player-driven discovery. The item contingent progression of Prime will put your navigational skills to the test. The returning items have all seen excellent transitions into the 3D gameplay, such as the spider ball now attaching specifically to special tracks. It's an excellent way to bring this item back without completely shattering the balance between your traversal abilities. The beam weapons see less interesting utilization since all of them now just open color-coded doors instead of doing more unique things like freezing enemies for platforms or shooting through walls. But they still get multifaceted utilization as weapons and tools. The new boost ball is a personal favorite because it adds an extra layer of depth to the movement tech of the morph ball. It's really fun to boost around quickly and smash into enemies or time your boost ball charges to ascend a half pipe. Prime's item progression is similar to Super Metroid's, and I've already discussed this core gameplay loop concept in other videos. I'm not going to repeat myself too much on this subject since it's largely identical to how it was done in Super. With that said, I really want to emphasize that Metroid Prime does this kind of thing absolutely phenomenally. Another massive highlight of Metroid Prime. Prime is different from other Metroid games for having not only a more linear world layout, but also a very linear item progression order. Metroid Prime has virtually no intended sequence breaking or non-linear item progression to its name. The exceptions are some largely inconsequential instances, such as the optional beam combos and the Chozo artifacts that can be collected in any order. You can also collect the X-ray visor either before or after plasma and grapple beam. Changing exactly when you choose to pick up the X-ray visor is, again, entirely inconsequential because having X-ray earlier or later along this progression path makes no difference. It actually ends up being a potentially harmful inclusion of non-linearity because of my previously described issue with the plasma and X-ray item checks being placed together at the end of such a long linear stretch. The only outright potentially intuitive sequence break that I can point to in Prime is a really neat trick for early Wave Buster. In the Ruined Shrine, I figured out that you can jump carefully on this Spider Ball track to collect Wave Buster before Spider Ball. But my buddy Bug Lumps was trying out Prime for the first time, and he managed to discover a way to get Wave Buster before even Boost Ball by carefully jumping on some geometry in the room. Wave Buster is hardly worth going out of your way for, but the intrinsic value of experience experimenting with your moveset to discover sequence breaks is so much fun that I really enjoy doing these kinds of things. Counter-intuitive sequence breaking is not something I get much enjoyment out of, but since Prime has left me no choice, I have learned a couple of really neat tricks for sequence breaking. You can perform the dash move while using the scan visor in specific locations in a very particular way to gain way more momentum than the game ever intended, and this allows you to cross huge gaps. In the landing site, you can use the scan dash to collect space jump boots right as you land. From there, you can space jump up to this missile tank to skip Hive Mecha. And you can even skip the plated beetle guarding the morph ball. Play normally until you get the various suit, and now you can go straight for wave beam instead of the boost ball. Use wave beam to reach wave buster early, grab boost ball after wave beam, and you can then head back to Chozo Ruins. Use this crazy infinite speed morph ball glitch to clip into the opposite side of the room for early power bombs. Then clip into this spider ball track in a specific way to ascend to bypass Spider Ball. Carefully jump onto this geometry to again bypass Spider Ball and make your way to get early Ice Beam. You can then go straight to the backside of Talon Overworld and perform a tricky double bomb jump to bypass the need for the gravity suit. You should be able to go straight to the phase on mines now. In the main quarry, perform a slope jump to get up on top of this crane. Walk across it and carefully jump onto the back of this Spider Ball track to grab Grapple Beam first. Now you can go get Spider Ball. Go grab Plasma plasma beam, and then wrap up with the phase on mines. From there, collect the artifacts like normal, but since you skipped the gravity suit, you're going to have to perform an underwater ghetto jump for the artifact of Life Giver. This completely insane run I just described is only possible not because I experimented with the game's moveset and intuited things myself, but instead because I looked up a bunch of videos on cool tricks online. As much as I strongly prefer intuitive sequence breaking, I have to admit that performing all of these tricks for myself does bring its own kind of 
enjoyment. I think even so, it really is disappointing that Prime's sequence breaking potential is relegated to extremely counterintuitive and glitchy tricks like these. What makes these tricks especially regrettable is that many of them are patched out of future releases of the game. Most of these are either infinitely more difficult or outright impossible unless you're playing version 1.0 of the GameCube release. Retro Studios decided to patch these tricks out of later releases of the game, and that felt tremendously disappointing for me. Metroid Prime is a single-player game, and basically none of these glitches are going to be found by accident by the majority of players. I don't think I will ever understand why Retro Studios continues to go out of their way to make this game less fun. Even in the remaster, Retro Studios still decided to add in additional invisible walls to further prevent sequence breaking, demonstrating a design philosophy that I simply cannot agree with or understand. How many are up here? You would think that you can simply just jump up to this platform. You cannot actually. There is an invisible wall. I was holding up there and I just fall off because I couldn't la land on the tin edge anymore. Sequence breaking is such a massive appeal for many players, and I don't know why Retro is actively fighting to keep it out of their games even still. Metroid Fusion similarly committed to an entirely linear item order, but Fusion also centered its entire identity around this design philosophy, and enjoyed many benefits that come from this design, as discussed in that video. Prime, on the other hand, does not benefit from removing sequence breaking, and the GameCube 1.0 version already proves that this kind of stuff is harmless. There's no greater narrative purpose like Fusion, it just feels like an unfortunate consequence of their take on a transition to 3D. I enjoyed sequence breaking in the GameCube 1.0 release, and now it's all but forgotten with the remaster. To give Prime some credit, bosses are built with expectations that you have specific items. For example, Thardis expects you to have the Thermal Visor in order for you to be able to face him. His fight utilizes the Thermal Visor in a mildly interesting way, and I suppose that could be ruined with a non-linear item order. The thing is, Prime already seems seems to account for this by placing an item check that forces you to have Thermal Visor to even enter the room. Additionally, Thardis can also be defeated without ever even using the Thermal Visor. It's far from impossible for Prime's developers to account for multiple possibilities within their boss and world design so that there are a legitimate means of bypassing certain items. I get that the game was never initially built with that kind of design in mind, but I still don't think that justifies taking these options away from players. Previous Metroid games trusted players to accept the consequences that came with their actions, and it made for a uniquely challenging and interesting gameplay experience. Prime doesn't trust me to make any of these decisions for myself, and thus the mere possibility is removed even further with every new release, for what I see as no good reason. Backtracking can be fun, the previous Metroid games made that clear, but Prime is obsessed with elongating and repeating backtracking ad nauseum. Levels are not nearly interconnected enough, not only on their own, but also between each other for this to feel well paced. Over and over again, the game will outright require you to backtrack through the same exact stretch of Magmore Caverns, offering virtually nothing new to see each time. Assuming you know exactly where to go, I counted around 8 times, bare minimum, required trips through the Magmore Caverns. This is an absolute pace killer. And and there's nothing to gain from including this. I know I'm really hammering this point in, but it really is just that prevalent of an issue. Backtracking still offers a great opportunity to try new abilities in older areas, and it's otherwise plenty satisfying. The game will place tougher enemies in older areas, but they also like to pick some of the most annoying enemies to do this with, such as adult shigots and flying pirates. Backtracking will change the music of the starting area, again like Super Metroid. Also like Super Metroid, it feels like this game really doesn't do much to make the world feel like it's changing. The game does include some instances of the environments changing, such as the power turning off in the Fendrona lab and the toxic water returning to normal in the Chozo ruins. One thing that especially doesn't help this feeling of backtracking feeling samey is the removal of abilities like the speed booster, space jump, and screw attack. In the 2D games, it's really satisfying to feel Samus become more powerful and zip around with your new traversal abilities. Prime couldn't quite figure out how to make these work in 3D, so Samus doesn't feel like she's made as great of a leap in her abilities by the end. Another thing that makes backtracking feel less satisfying than the 2D games is that you sometimes do not push into new territory when returning to older areas with new items. Once again, Fendrana Drifts and Chozo Ruins handle things especially well with offering entire new areas when you return, such as with Fendrana being divided into thirds or discovering the depths of the Chozo Ruins when you return with Spiderball. Having entire new chunks of a level to explore makes for satisfying exploration and discovery. Certain instances of required backtracking feel like they really don't pay off with something new or interesting to see, 
such as going all the way back to Talon Overworld for the space jump boots. You backtrack through the same path that brought you there, and when you finally arrive, the boots are just sitting out in the open in a tiny room. Behind this door, they could have built an entire new area to be explored. Again, similar situation with the grapple beam. I'm not saying that every item needs to be stored in its own super interesting and original part of the level, but if you're going to require the player to do all of this backtracking, then you should give them a better motivator to backtrack. This issue is made exponentially worse with the Chozo artifacts, which I will get to in a bit. The navigational challenge of Metroid Prime, outside of the Chozo ruins anyways, hardly comes from the layout of the rooms themselves. The difficult part of figuring out where to go in Metroid Prime is knowing where to backtrack to along those more linear level layouts. An example of such would be when you arrive in Fendron Drifts and obtain the boost ball, and you're expected to turn around to go find the space jump boots. It's not like you actually have that many different pathways available to you, it's just that backtracking has been emphasized so much that returning to older areas has become a challenge itself. Metroid Prime absolutely refuses to restrict your navigation. There are only two one-way paths in the entire game, and they both lead to the sun chamber. Vines grow over one door and the other is a one-way drop that requires Spider-Ball to climb back up. Beyond those instances, Prime will never place restrictions on your ever-expanding explorable area, for better and worse. This complete lack of guidance places agency back in the player's hands. There's no chance of observing an invisible hand if that hand barely exists, after all. But this also means that Prime is more than okay with asking you to wander around in an ever-expanding world, searching for that one correct spot. Searching for needles in a haystack like this can become exhausting, and I think this kind of design makes the hint system feel like somewhat of a crutch for saving the pacing. Of course, things again come back to Magmore Caverns. Especially considering the fact that Magmore Caverns exists, it can become exhausting having to cross it again and again every time you want to check something on each side of the caverns. I'm not necessarily against the idea of Prime refusing to impose navigational restrictions on the player, but no game with the Magmore Caverns should be asking anyone to backtrack this often. This issue of pacing within Prime's back Backtracking is made exponentially worse if you decide not to play with a hint system turned on. It's really easy to optimize your traversal if you've been playing the game for decades like I have, but newcomers not interested in hints are going to spend an absurd amount of time in the Magmore Caverns, even in the best case scenario. This deadly combination of Metroid Prime refusing to interconnect its world in multiple key areas, but also refusing to impose any kind of navigational restrictions makes for a tremendously poorly paced, unguided first playthrough. It's not just just that it's a level specifically designed to waste your time, but the entire world is formulated to force you through the Magmore Caverns constantly. Everything from the item placement, item progression ordering, level design, room placement, and the elevator placement is carefully designed to inflate your playtime as much as possible. And again, Retro Studios themselves said that they deliberately designed this game to be as long as possible because they were full of terror that the game was too short. Pacing is one of my biggest issues with the first Prime game, and I think much of this comes from the way the world structure, item progression, and navigation all play into each other. The map in the Metroid Prime games is similar to the Super Metroid map in a lot of ways. The map will still automatically fill in each time you enter a new room, and you can still find map stations to give you a chunk of the unexplored map colored blue. Retro made a number of changes to this map as well. The map now has an optional hint system feature. The game will eventually give you notifications of suspicious room locations, these rooms being save stations, map rooms, or a new item. These hints will trigger automatically after 30 minutes, which means that a player might find themselves aimlessly wandering while they wait for the next hint. This hint system helps trim the fat on the clunky backtracking by telling you where to go, but not how to get there. It's great for newcomers, but I think this might miss the point of Metroid's navigation for some players. I enjoy being able to intuit the way to go on my own. The hint system can be turned off in the options menu, so its inclusion is harmless and important for those who benefit from a more guided experience. The map no longer features icons to indicate the presence of items within any room. I can't think of any good reason to remove this feature. It works really well in the 2D games, and I don't see why it shouldn't be here too. The hum noise that items now make is appreciated, but since you have to be close to an item to hear it in the first place, I hardly see this as a sufficient alternative. The map also lacks item percentages on a per-level basis as Fusion and other games have done before and after. Another feature I'd like to see would be the ability to add map markers. Corruption introduced this feature and it's a godsend. If this were in Prime 1, it would help cut down on backtracking tremendously. Unlike Super Metroid, doors are labeled on Prime's 
map. The problem is that you can only view the doors in any given room by highlighting one room at a time. So if you obtain the ice beam, for example, you can't glance at the entire map to identify the location of an ice beam door. You have to slowly pan across every room that might have a white door. One nice detail is that every room in the game is named on the map. Not only does this help with remembering rooms for easier navigation, but it also makes the world that much more believable as a living space. It's yet another little extra nugget of detail. Aside from a few irritatingly lacking features, the map largely improves upon Super's map and sets a solid standard for the sequels to follow. The last part of the game is to go on a hunt for 12 hidden collectibles called the Chozo Artifacts. If a player finds the artifact temple at the beginning of the game, they can scan 12 hints that will provide your logbook with the name of the 12 rooms that contain the artifacts. Collecting every single artifact is not optional. You cannot proceed to the end game unless you go back out to collect all 12 artifacts spread and hidden all over Talon 4. It's likely that by the end of the game, the player may have already collected at least a few of these. If you find the artifact temple early on and search for the artifacts as you play through the game, then you can have 11 of them by the time you acquire the phase on suit. That's the best case scenario of a very well-optimized playthrough. For the first-time player, it's entirely possible that you'll get to this artifact hunt without having known that it even existed until the end of the game. So in the worst case scenario, the player is asked to search the entire planet all over again, completely out of left field, for no good reason. The artifacts are usually kept in tiny empty rooms placed just off of familiar areas. This means that you are going back to areas the game knows you've already been through, doing things you've already done, seeing almost nothing new, and backtracking through linear stretches like Magmore Caverns and the Fendrana Labs even more. This is blatant padding through and through. It will certainly bother some more than others because some seem to barely mind the requirement of this fetch quest. I sometimes hear players defend the artifact hunt by saying that you shouldn't be rushing to see the end of the game. They say that if you're upset about having more game to play, then Metroid Prime was never the right game for you. I want to be clear about what my exact issues are with these artifacts. The artifact hunt is disappointing, not because it asks you to explore and play more of the game, but because it asks you to retread areas the game knows you've already visited to see and do barely anything interesting or new. If some of them pushed into new explorable areas instead of leading to small empty rooms, or had you do something more mechanically interesting, then they'd be a lot better. Some do manage to be pretty harmless by being easily obtainable on the main path your first time through an area, such as the artifacts of Chozo and Nature. At least with these, you can get them on your first visit to these areas if you already know about them beforehand. Knowing about them beforehand is a big if. However, some might ask you to fight enemies and bosses you've already seen before, such as fighting even more Chozo ghosts in a room you've already been to for the artifact of Wild. Similar situation with the artifact of Warrior, where you must return to Elite Research to fight a reskin of the already boring elite pirate, but now it has even more health. Many of the artifacts simply require backtracking to older areas with new power-ups. The five artifacts that must be collected after getting the plasma beam especially force a lot of otherwise unnecessary backtracking onto the player, and that's especially unfortunate for this game that already has issues with pacing and backtracking. Some of these artifacts do offer some mildly interesting gameplay, but I think that the game would be so much better off if they had just made these optional. Even the developers themselves have said in interviews that artifact hunts in the Prime games are pace killers. We were really worried the game was going to be really short. And so... Yeah, um, so it's a way of padding or extending the length of a game, right? Because that happens quite yeah. a lot. I mean, they did it in Zelda, Wind Waker as well. I was going to say, it's the same <laughs> pattern as Zelda. Yeah. 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 And then on Prime... Yeah, so for Prime 1, I know that came in... That came in pretty late, uh, honestly. Um, that was... Yeah, that was that was very much like a Japanese concern. Prime two, I that was that was so weird. It was the whole like dark visor, find things to find things to find things. It felt like uh, <laughs> Zelda Wind Waker, you know, where you're like finding the treasure maps to find the map to the treasure to find the treasure to yeah. It, it was a similar it was a similar thing, and I agree those are those are pace killers. Like many other aspects of Prime's design, they are the result of the developers attempting to pad out the game length by any means necessary. The Artifact Hunt isn't just more of the usual gameplay, it's a complete gameplay shift into something tedious and boring. These recycle the same areas in a way comparable to something like the Doc Robot stages from Mega Man 3. People don't criticize this part of Mega Man for having more game, they criticize it because it's reusing assets in an unimaginative way to artificially length 
lengthen the game, and its execution is uninteresting. Metroid Prime may not be a first-person shooter, but first-person shooting is still very much a massive part of this game. It's how you dispatch enemies and bosses. It's a considerable portion of your total playtime. The central mechanic of the Prime Trilogy's combat is the lock-on and strafing systems. These mechanics are fairly self-explanatory, as they appear in countless other video games. A lot of the time, when an enemy is attacking, you can evade by dodging left or right, or by jumping up into the air. Even in the first game, this mechanic is put to pretty good use with enemies like beetles, baby shegoths, chozo ghosts, and the turrets. Each of these enemies have clear patterns and or telegraphs for indicating that, that they're about to attack. Carefully picking when to dodge and reading enemy telegraphs makes for interesting enemy encounters. Plenty of enemies are placed in areas where there's not enough room to dodge, so you're forced to consider other means of avoiding damage, like shooting the enemy before it can dive bomb you, or jumping out of the way. Enemies in Prime do so little damage to you that their hits basically don't matter. As I went over in my Metroid Fusion video, even basic early game enemies in that game do far more damage than even the final boss of this game. Less damage isn't necessarily a bad thing, but this feels like an extreme case of poor balancing. I get that the devs can't account for exactly how much health you have, but it feels like they went too far to compensate for this. Enemies seriously do so little damage that it feels like you have to actively try to lose in order to die. As long as you're not playing completely recklessly, you are certain to absolutely steamroll every enemy without much effort. Since a large component of the combat is the arsenal of weapons available to the player, it'd be ideal for this arsenal to be well balanced and have each ability carry value and opportunity for utilization. As for the beam weapons, they are far from balanced. The power beam seems to offer an advantage through an incredible rate of fire and fast projectile speed, balanced by its low damage. It comes in handy for fast moving enemies or areas with many tiny enemies. The wave beam is easily the least useful beam in the game. It has a medium rate of fire, medium travel speed, and the charge shots stun some enemies. Oftentimes, any other beam will do the job better. It's supposed to be most effective against robotic enemies, but there are only two robotic enemies in the game, so it doesn't get much of a chance to shine, outside of the outright required instances. Wave Beam's unique homing ability is hardly valuable in a game with lock-on and so many slow-moving enemies, and it's even less useful when missiles also home in on targets. Turrets have an extra chance to hit you if you use Wave Beam against them, so players are just better off using missiles instead. The Ice Beam has the slowest rate of fire, slowest travel speed, but high damage, and it often freezes enemies. If you fire a missile at a frozen enemy, they can be killed instantly for a quick kill. This beam generally requires you to get close to your enemies to hit them and it is especially effective against many enemies like Magmores, Metroids, or the Flying Pirates. It's not very effective against the turrets, or any ice creature in the Fendrana Drifts, or fast-moving, longer-ranged enemies. I think this beam is the most mechanically interesting, because if it were any easier to hit your targets, it'd be all too easy to use the ice and missile combo on nearly every enemy in the game. Its high potential is kept in check with its slow rate of fire and travel speed. The Plasma Beam is one of the last items you get in the game, and as a result, it's it seems the devs wanted to give you something to break the combat completely. No matter what the situation is, the plasma beam is almost always the definitive choice. The beam has a good rate of fire, tremendous damage, near instant travel speed, it catches enemies on fire, but it has a somewhat limited range. Most of the rooms in this game are not big enough for you to notice the limited range, and the charge shot has infinite range anyways, so the one drawback is largely a non-issue. The charge shot instantly turns most enemies into ashes. Even partially charged shots can do this. Even enemies of the Magmore Caverns go down quickly with this weapon. So unless an enemy is literally color-coded to be immune to the plasma beam, it's likely the definitive beam weapon for the rest of the game. Missiles are useful for their high damage and homing properties. Being a limited resource, they should be fired with just a bit more mindfulness than your beam weapons. There's a decently easy exploit to pull off that allows you to fire the missiles at a much faster rate of fire than intended. This makes missiles feel ridiculously powerful, perhaps a bit too powerful. You can build a huge stock of missiles, and you're likely to land every shot since they home in on targets so aggressively. I would have preferred if missiles felt like a bit more of a risk since they're so powerful. Perhaps their tracking could be reduced to allow for more calculated decision making. The game has four upgrades to your beams, known as beam combos. As far as the visuals and sound effects go, all of these beam combos are satisfying to use. 
Super missiles are the power beam combo, and they no longer use their own consumable resource as they have done in games like Super Metroid. It now depletes from your supply of regular missiles. I like this change because it makes that single supply more useful keeping missile tanks useful to the endgame. The other three beam combos aren't really worth talking about because they are all poorly balanced and highly situational. Of the four beam combos of the game, supers cost the least number of missiles, have the best tracking of any weapon, deal the most damage out of any weapon, and have infinite range and high projectile speed. Other beam combos cost way more missiles and deal less damage, and sometimes have way less range. Supers are given to you first, are by far the best ones, and they're the only required beam combo combo to collect in the game. Wavebuster has one instance of being useful against an already easy boss, and the beam combos are useful when the game forces you to fight color-coded enemies. I guess that's something, but it's clear that these weapons are situational at best and completely forgettable at worst. The Arsenal of Prime isn't really balanced well enough to reward experimentation with a variety of weapons. There are clear winners in this arsenal. This makes experimenting with your weapons only situationally rewarding. Take the Shigoth, a mini-boss that ends up regularly spawning throughout the Fendrona Drifts later in the game. A player in the game might try using a power bomb to find that it can one-hit kill the Shigoth. This is Metroid Prime's combat at its best, in my opinion. The challenge offered to the player isn't a matter of precision aiming, it's about dodging attacks and experimenting with your arsenal. Similar situation with trying things out like the ice missile combo to quickly dispatch certain enemies. There are moments here where the game feels like it's realizing its potential with experimentation, but these moments are few and far between. This poor weapon balance leads to a samey feeling combat dynamic between the majority of enemies. Generally, there are two types of enemies in Metroid games. Enemies designed for the exploration, and enemies designed for the combat. There is some crossover and in-between, and there are even enemies that start out as combat-focused that are later placed in as normal common enemies. Exploration enemies are better suited for more non-linear areas in the game. Enemies like your Zoomers, Gel Zaps, and Venom Weeds are not here so much to give you a legitimate challenge, but more so just act as environmental set dressing that may or may not occupy a moment of your time. Enemies designed for exploration do not usually hit hard and they usually move slowly. This de-emphasizes combat in favor of exploration-focused gameplay. In a game specifically designed around extensive backtracking, this kind of enemy design makes perfect sense. Some enemies might briefly test you in some small way, such as the gel zaps sucking you in or the burrowers popping out to surprise you. Maybe you have to pay attention to an enemy to time your platforming carefully, such as with the flicker bats in Fendrana. This kind of enemy is built around offering moments of inconvenience more than a proper life or death battle. As far as exploration focused enemies are concerned, I think Prime pulls this off excellently with interesting and varied gameplay offerings. Combat focused enemies serve a different purpose in this game. These kinds of enemies include space pirates, all of the boss encounters, and all of the mini-bosses. These guys are placed within the linear stretches of the world, and they are meant to truly test your combative abilities. I place the space pirates into this category because these guys almost always occupy the linear stretches of the world, such as the Frigate Orpheon, Vendrana Labs, and Phazon Mines. These areas do not test your navigation, they are instead placing focus on puzzle solving, platforming, and especially combat. I think that Prime fails to make its pirate encounter Hunters interesting. Space pirates have remarkably simple AI, and there's little variation between the different kinds of pirates. Standard pirates will walk towards you and sporadically pepper you with scattered shots. There's no telegraph reading with these guys, and there's hardly much of any proper pattern to discern with their behavior, so you're left with just spamming the dodge button and firing away. The only viable way to utilize your dodge move is to mash it to increase the likelihood that you won't get hit. Similar story with the flying pirates. These guys can be harder to hit, but again, they they just sometimes fire missiles at you with no discernible pattern or telegraph. Exact same story with the Shadow Pirates. The Shadow Pirates are invisible, but you'll only see a single one before you obtain the Thermal Visor. This one is programmed to not turn invisible anyways, so the invisibility has absolutely no impact on the encounter beyond simply choosing to equip the Thermal Visor so you can see them. There's no dynamicism to virtually any of these encounters. What's even worse is that Metroid Prime offers virtually no combative enemy variety. The the healthier space pirates at the beginning of the game are dispatched very similarly to the space pirates in the endgame. The game reuses the same lackluster AI to carry the entire combat experience. There is no strategy with assessing multiple enemy types at one time to make on-the-fly decisions about enemy prioritization. There's no dynamicism here because 
of the lacking enemy variety, but the game often wouldn't even let you experiment with your arsenal since the beam troopers are color-coded to be susceptible to only one specific weapon. Beam troopers are spongier reskins of the space pirates that force you to match your beam to their armor color. Their scan says that they're supposed to be using your own weapons against you, but all variants only use the same pea shooter and blade. Nothing new or interesting is offered with these encounters, just match the beam color and spam the dodge button while you hammer them with charge shots. No pirate ever evolves beyond this dynamic. This is nowhere near interesting enough to carry the gameplay experience of multiple entire areas, such as the Fendrana lab treks and nearly all of Faison mines. I am aware that combat is not the focus of this game, but when you make so much of your world design and progression this linear, moment-to-moment -moment gameplay ends up taking center stage. All of the pretty graphics, visor effects, scan visor text, and excellent music sure help these areas become more interesting, but underneath all of that is some of the most shallow and empty gameplay in the entire Metroid series. The lock-on means that you're not practicing precision aiming, the dodging never changes because the pirates barely use any telegraphing or readable patterns, and experimenting with your arsenal is either not worth it or outright impossible. I don't think combat needs to be super deep and interesting in a Metroid game, but again, why would you design so much of your world to place focus squarely on combat? A huge portion of this gameplay pie chart is fighting the same crappy space pirates over and over in linear stretches of gameplay. These space pirates wouldn't be such a problem if the world also offered some interesting navigational challenge or something, but here in Prime, these massive stretches of linear rooms filled with space pirates end up being the worst parts of the game. It unfortunately does not stop there, because there are a number of specific enemies that I'd like to discuss. Elite pirates are the fruition of Project Helix. They look imposing and dangerous, towering over you with aggressive posture and slow, weighty animations. I think the melee and shockwave attacks work well to test the reflexes of the player, but the issue comes from that orb in its hand. As long as this orb is held, you cannot damage the pirate and it can't damage you. It's a frequent and lengthy stalemate for no good reason. This attack is used too often and for too long. Elite pirates needed to be the challenge that the story and their presence wanted them to be. How am I supposed to believe that Project Helix is any kind of threat to galactic peace when all it manages to do is threaten my patience? As they are now, you just wait for the hand to drop and blast them in the face. They test your ability to wait, and nothing more. Sometimes they just decide not to raise their orb, and you can just blast away with supers and kill them in a few seconds. You could use the thermal visor to lock onto the artillery cannon on its back, but why? This attack is such a non-issue that it's not worth bothering with. These guys appear a good number of times in the phase on mines, and they are even more boring than the normal pirate encounters. The Metroids themselves this time around are incredibly disappointing. Talon Metroids are a far cry from their 2D counterparts. In the previous games, just knowing that you're in an area with Metroids is enough to create tension. They were so fast the moment they appeared on screen, only stopping when frozen. If they managed to get to you, they were difficult to shake off and sapped tons of health. There was nothing like them in any of the games. They stood out for being so unique and dangerous. Compare that to Prime, where they're small and slow. They just float around, don't notice you until you're real close, can be killed by any beam, they drain barely any energy, and attaching them will always just take a single bomb. Talon Metroids do not carry half of the fear and tension of their 2D counterparts. I feel so apathetic towards the Metroids in this game, even when the game throws multiple of them at you. Of course, the transition to 3D necessitates that these enemies would change. I get that the transition to 3D requires a redesign, but this just feels like way too much of a departure. They spend so much time just floating around, and the development Developers go hog wild at the end of the game and place a ton in to make up for how weak they are. I would have preferred very few but powerful Metroids to maintain their image in the series. I get that these ones are Talon Metroids, weaker versions of the real thing, but even the Fission Metroids are blatant recolors with that same boring match the colors gimmick. Fission Metroids should be more dangerous than even normal Metroids, and instead they are one of the most boring enemies in the whole game. I know this one especially will ruffle some feathers, but I think that the Chozo ghosts are some of the best enemy encounters in the game. Unlike other enemy encounters, these guys require you to keep your head on a swivel and watch both your radar and your surroundings carefully. The dynamic of the fight 
fight is unique in that you need to manage your surroundings and time your attacks with their brief periods of vulnerability. They have windows of standing still, meaning you have to watch carefully and assess the situation in order to take advantage of their weaknesses. Once you have the x-ray visor, you can make quick work of them to prevent repeat encounters from dragging. I feel like I'm finally being tested in an interesting way, quickly looking around and watching my radar for when they appear. You only have to fight a few of these before the rest are made optional too. Shozo ghosts are by far the very best enemy encounters in the game for testing you to do something other than spam your dodge and charge shots. On the whole, combat is a low point of Prime. Any linear stretch with the space pirates quickly becomes incredibly tedious for having samey and simple enemy encounters. It feels like the dodge mechanic was off to a good start with enemies like baby Shigoths and beetles, but the pirates never evolved this mechanic beyond its basics. Enemies feel undercooked and blatantly recycled. The only fully original enemy in the phase on mines is one of the worst enemy encounters of the entire game. I'm not trying to say that bad enemy design ruins Metroid Prime, but I will say that it ruins the gameplay of the linear stretches of the game for me. Combat is completely inoffensive in areas like most of the Fendron Adrifts or the Chozo Ruins, but it quickly becomes boring when it's the focus, such as with the Phazon Mines. They need to either not design their world to focus on the combat, or they need to make that combat more interesting. In terms of artistic design, animation, and lore, the bosses are handled with tremendous care. It's absolutely glorious to see these massive imposing creatures in proper 3D and I think Prime more than does the series justice when it comes to the presentation surrounding the bosses. Starting from the beginning, the Parasite Queen is a simple tutorial boss that I don't have much to say on. She has a rotating shield that plays into the fight in an interesting way, and her acid breath attack does well to teach the player about dodging. There is nothing else going on here, and not much to say as a result. I dislike the Hive Mecha. It has only a single attack, which is to spawn red war wasps. These wasps will circle you for a while before stopping to charge you. After all the wasps die, the Hive Mecha's weak point is exposed and you shoot it. Do that three times with more war wasps each time. I like that this boss benefits from paying attention to the radar to track the wasps, but there is nothing else going on here. I get that this was the first 3D Metroid and all, but this boss is way too simple and boring. The best kinds of video game bosses should be fun to battle even on repeat playthroughs. A skilled player returning to face the Hive Mecha again can't do anything to make the fight play out differently at all. This is the second weakest boss in the game. My least favorite boss in the game, and one of the worst bosses in the entire series is the Incinerator Drone. Jumping over the flames is a simple game of jump rope. The green wasps spawn in and try to shoot projectiles at you, but it really is way too simple and easy to dispatch them effortlessly. Just lock on and press fire, and they're gone. The big issue with this boss is that there is nothing to do but wait for the weak point to randomly decide to appear. The boss never evolves or does anything new, it just rotates its fire jets, and extremely easy wasps come in trying to deal chip damage. You're stuck waiting around, watching this robot spin for what feels like forever. Zero tension, zero interesting gameplay. This guy just bores the hell out of me. Flagra is an okay boss fight. It has a few serviceable attacks that work fine enough. This boss is again too simple to be interesting. Flagra needs these sundials to stay active, and shooting all of them will stun Flagra for you to roll into these tunnels to lay a bomb to deal damage. This is the fourth boss fight in the game, and it doesn't even feel mechanically interesting enough to be a decent first boss. Every time Flagra is stunned, you have to watch these drawn-out cutscenes that clearly spell out exactly what to do, and it feels like this entire boss fight is just extremely basic puzzle solving and watching the same drawn-out cutscene over and over. Flagra might sometimes block off your path with some toxic weeds, which is interesting. I wish Flagra did more to try to actually put up any kind of fight, because as it is now, this is a completely forgettable gameplay experience. The Shigoth is finally a decent fight. Blindly firing at this thing won't solve anything. The game actually asks you to think carefully and utilize your arsenal in some interesting ways. You can either read the boss's telegraphs to take advantage of its vulnerability periods to get some damage in with the missiles, or you can roll underneath it to lay bombs along its soft underbelly. I like having options in my boss fights, and I enjoy being rewarded for experimenting. It's also great that this boss finally requires me to do something that isn't obvious, and it asks me to actually engage with it in some capacity beyond simply waiting. It even has a few interesting attacks, like a short-range frost breath and some fast-moving projectiles. The Shigoth is definitely 
definitely one of the better fights in the game. Thardis is a boss that many players describe as the worst boss in the game for how much time it spends rolling around, forcing you to wait instead of fighting it. Players lament that this creates a start-stop dynamic with its roll attack that forces you to sit around and do nothing. Thardis also has two really long drawn-out animations for fogging and defogging the room that force you to, again, do nothing but watch. One somewhat obscure saving grace of Thardis's rolling attack is that you actually can damage Thardis while it's rolling around. While Thardis is in a ball, you need to also get into your morph ball and place bombs in its path. Bombs actually do a lot of damage to Thardis, and I really get a kick out of this creative use of morph ball bombs. I do agree that the fog animations last too long, but I think this bomb weakness makes Thardis one of the more interesting fights of the game. I think it's fun to try to get as close as I can to Thardis without making contact to place as many bombs as I can. What especially makes this fight interesting to me is that the fight is asking you to use nearly your entire arsenal up to this point. Boost ball, bombs, super missiles, and thermal visor are all massively helpful in this fight. This is a great example of Metroid Prime finally taking advantage of the linear item progression. The game knows what items you have, so it knows what to ask of the player during boss fights. Everything from your positioning, timing, reflexes, decision making, and problem solving are tested in the Thardis fight. I think there's plenty of room for improvement, but overall, I think Thardis is among the best fights in the game, at least if you know about his weakness to bombs. The Omega Pirate seems to have a mixed reputation. I think I too feel similarly mixed about this guy. The armor plates are a great way to illustrate the power of Phazon and keep the player busy. But just like the Phazon Elite, the Omega Pirate shares the moveset of an Elite Pirate. That time-wasting orb absorbs all projectiles, forcing you to wait for the Omega Pirate to use his shockwave attack. Waiting around for the boss to finally use its one attack that lets you damage it feels pretty boring, especially for what's supposed to be a late game challenge. What elevates this fight is what happens after you remove each of the four armor plates. The Omega calls calls in help and turns invisible. Defeat the beam troopers quickly and figure out that you have to use the x-ray visor to spot the Omega attempting to regenerate its armor. In later versions of this game, such as the remaster, you can use power bombs to decimate the Omega's phase on armor, both bypassing the orb stalemate and rewarding out of the box thinking. Omega Pirate has plenty about it that I dislike, such as the fact that the beam troopers are still boring to battle, but I think it's one of the better fights of the game. I'm becoming fatigued on every Metroid game deciding to include Ridley for what I see is no good reason. Prime relied heavily on lots of Super Metroid iconography, so I can only see Ridley's inclusion as an extension of that mindset. I don't think the gameplay of this boss fares very well either. Ridley immediately shows off a variety of attacks which can feel difficult to understand how to avoid. Perhaps similar to his fight in Super Metroid, the dynamic of his fight feels a bit more focused on trading blows rather than methodically dodging telegraphed attacks. I'm not saying that these attacks can't ever be dodged, but his stomping attack move was straight up unfair in the GameCube version. Ridley does have other attacks that can be dodged consistently in any version, like dashing out of the way of the missile barrage, boosting away from his carpet bomb, or jumping over his laser. Meta Ridley will frequently fly away from the arena to do this one carpet bombing attack alongside a laser beam attack. Similar to the problem with most of Prime's bosses, Meta Ridley once again forces you to simply wait around for no good reason. Once you've finally done enough damage, Meta Ridley has a second phase in which his wings are damaged, and the two of you are forced to fight on the ground. Instead of wasting time by repeatedly flying around, Ridley instead can only be damaged if he decides to use one of his moves that leaves him vulnerable. He'll just randomly decide to roar at you and open his mouth. Damage his mouth enough, and his actual weak point is revealed. How long this fight will take can vary quite a bit depending on your luck. I can appreciate that the timing to dodge his charge attack is especially strict, but when it's the only move he uses over and over with the occasional laser, it becomes kinda boring just waiting, dodging, waiting. The Wii version utilizes the stomp move far more often. This doesn't make for a very interesting gameplay otherwise. Ridley's fight is the one and only time that combat is enhanced by the free aiming. Every enemy was designed with the GameCube controls in mind, so there are virtually no opportunities for precision aiming to matter at all in this game. For whatever reason, Ridley's charge move is the exception, and it is fun to try to aim for his mouth just as he's about to charge. I think the Ridley fights are often some of the weakest fights in their respective games, and Metroid Prime follows suit with one of its most time-wasting and boring boss encounters. I am always excited to face the Metroid Prime when I get to the impact crater. The black carapace protects the blue gelatinous core located inside. Scanning it will show you a more human looking face, which very much adds to the uncanny terror of this creature. The entire story has been leading up to this confrontation against the source of the conflict of the pirates, the Chozo, and the very planet itself. The Metroid Prime has a massive variety of attacks, as any good final boss should. Everything from a shockwave, missile barrage, homing energy balls, swipe attack, charge attack, 
snare attack, and acid breath. These attacks require you to do everything from jumping, dodging, boosting, blasting, rolling, and backing away to avoid damage. Nearly everything you've been learning through the other bosses is put to the test here in this fight. Not only that, but the boss has a massive health bar that takes lots of punishment. A player with a low health and missile count will certainly struggle here. If you have the full 250 missiles, you can use the beam combos to completely melt the boss's massive amount of health. It's one of those rare times that the ice spreader and wave buster are finally useful. The boss is color coded to communicate which beam can damage the boss at that time. It's nothing great groundbreaking, but it is nice to use every beam against this boss instead of the usual charged plasma shots and super missiles that you spammed on the last two. I wish the game hadn't already made me sick of this beam swapping gimmick with the beam troopers and fission metroids, but I think it actually does work here in the case of this final boss. The metroid prime does not often use invincibility frames. There's basically no mindless waiting around during this fight. The fight is long, but it puts that time to good use with the sheer variety of attacks. The metroid prime keeps the fight interesting to the end with introducing more attacks, changing more often, and changing its vulnerability on the fly as the fight continues. The Metroid Prime is easily the best fight in the game, and I would even say it's one of the best fights in the series. Once the first phase is over, the six tentacled essence of the Metroid Prime is fought in its own second battle. It has a blue translucent membrane with Metroid-like internal organs and that human-looking face with eyes. The tentacles can be used to create shockwaves and spawn Metroids with a pool of pure Phazon left behind. Standing in this pure Phazon and using the Phazon beam is the only way to damage the Metroid Prime. The boss can also turn invisible to all but one of three visors, meaning you need to alternate between your visors to locate and damage the boss. The problem with this boss is that I have just described everything this boss can do. That's it. The metroids that the Prime will summon will become more powerful variants as the fight continues, and the boss will become invisible more often. But nothing else changes. There's nothing to do during this boss but stare at it and jump over the shock waves over and over while you wait for the phase on. It gets a little interesting once the pool is down because you have to kill the metroids while jumping over the shockwave, but there's never anything more to that in this fight. Just play jump rope with a Metroid Prime and wait for it to finally spawn pure Phazon. Honestly, I'd consider this to be among the worst bosses of the entire series in terms of gameplay. It struggles with the same pitfalls that the other ones do, mindless waiting for a weak point to appear and being way too simple to stay interesting. Metroid Prime's bosses are one of the more heavily criticized aspects of this game and I'm inclined to agree with the general consensus. Boss fights in Metroid games are the game's chance to flex its combat muscles and give the player an interesting battle. I only really liked the first phase of the final boss, the Shigoth, Thardis, and maybe the Omega Pirate. Everything else genuinely feels like some of the worst parts of the entire series, especially with how ridiculously long they take. So many of the bosses are absolutely obsessed with wasting as much of your time as possible. Some of these encounters might offer some light puzzle solving to the first time player, but once the player has figured out what to do, all subsequent playthroughs put the player on autopilot for the entire duration of the boss fight. One such example would include Flagra. You're unlikely to die at all against Flagra, but absolutely nobody is challenged in any way when replaying this fight. Replay Playability is one of the greatest weaknesses of the bosses in Prime. If you thought they were boring on your first run through, they only get worse on subsequent runs. Bosses are a disappointment in Metroid Prime, even for this series that has a fairly spotty track record when it comes to bosses. This game offers a hard mode to be unlocked when the player beats normal mode. Prime's difficulty adjustments inflate enemy and boss health values and make enemies deal more damage. I think increasing enemy damage values is fine, but doubling enemy health bars does absolutely nothing for difficulty. It just further destroys the already poor pacing of the enemy and boss encounters. The combat was already way too simple and repetitive to justify its focus on normal mode, so playing hard mode just makes the issue doubly worse. Now you have to spend 20 twice as long spamming charge shots on those space pirates. These enemy encounters were already poorly designed, but making them twice as long makes for an even worse gameplay experience. I do not like Prime's hard mode at all. The casual mode is actually my preferred way to replay this game. It has enemy values, meaning that issues that I have with combat are less prevalent. It's great that these modes are optional, but I can't help but feel like Prime could have done so much more to make the encounters more interesting on harder difficulties. Aside from the combat encounters, the level design in Metroid Prime offers a variety of platforming and light puzzle solving. Puzzles come in different shapes and forms, such as these locked doors that only open once you scan four hidden nodes in a room. Your observational and searching skills are put to the test in mildly interesting ways. There's this one puzzle in the Chozo Ice Temple where you gotta figure out which of these four Chozo statues is destructible by shooting all of them or scanning to find out. Again, just mildly interesting. 
interesting. There are smaller light puzzle solving opportunities across Talon 4 that feel fairly inoffensive but also forgettable, like shooting stalactites to create platforms. These rooms designed around half pipes, boost ball spinners, or bomb slots can be interesting when there's some kind of challenge offered to the player. Take the puzzle in Elite Research. You can't just solve it by hammering on the B button. You have to put the pieces together to see that the spinner controls the rotation of the pulse beam cannon on the ceiling. Through observing environmental clues and experimentation, you can problem solve to open the way forward. I still think these spinners and bomb slots harm the world building and immersion, but mechanically, this is boost ball spinners done right. Compare this to any other use of the boost ball spinners elsewhere, and you'll see how easy it is for these to feel forgettable. Oftentimes, these spinners really are as simple as mashing B. It's not puzzling, not challenging, not mechanically substantive by any stretch of the imagination. Take the geothermal core. You spin each of these boosters to raise the platforms, which allows you to platform your way to the top, but what is being tested here? It's the same situation every time you see a new spinner, and it's literally impossible to fail the puzzle because there is no puzzle, nor any failure state. The spinners in the ruined courtyard turn on a bomb slot, so you're pressing a button to press another button. What's the point? The observatory is a perfect example. Four different clamps need to be released in order to extend these platforms. In terms of gameplay, this is mechanically shallow. The observatory has all these boring space pirate encounters, then it asks you to use four spinners in a row, then some mildly interesting platforming. What was even the point of having me do all of that time-wasting nonsense? All of this is to say that while the spinners aren't supposed to be challenging in and of themselves, the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay often fails to be interesting when these are involved. I think they are best suited for situations in which the spinner acts as a control mechanism for some puzzle or platforming challenge to be solved. What makes the spinners mechanically interesting isn't the act of using them themselves, but what they are attached to. Opening this shortcut in the Great Tree Hall to phase on mines is a great example. Or this boost ball spinner in Monitor Station asks you with remembering to return to this spinner with the boost ball. The game is challenging your navigational skills, asking you to return to older areas with new items. This is the one time any boost ball spinner ever does this, because all of the other spinners are placed after item checks that require items later in the linear progression order. It could be argued that interacting with the world in these ways gives the player a way to interact with the world to make it feel less static than it otherwise would. That tactile feedback you get when tinkering with mechanisms around the planet, the spectacle of watching the entire ceiling lift to reveal an entire new challenge does make these spinners visually interesting. I agree with this, but it's style over substance. They could have and should have been something more mechanically substantive in order to keep gameplay even remotely interesting. Generally speaking, I'd say the bomb slots fare much much better. Unlike spinners, the act of bombing the slot itself isn't the challenge offered. It's usually supplemented by an additional challenge like timed platforming or a double bomb jump. The challenge might be reaching the bomb slot in the first place, like boost balling up a half pipe or using a new beam to open the bomb slot. They offer a wealth of interactivity and interesting moment-to-moment -moment gameplay challenges, like activating a timed event to test your traversal and platforming abilities. The training chamber in Shoza Ruins is a great example of exactly what I'm looking for when it comes to these interactable parts of the world. They offer some interesting little gameplay moments for me to do something like try to reach another bomb slot before the time runs out. Easily the best puzzle in the game is this rotating spider ball track puzzle in or processing. There are three spider ball tracks intertwined along the segmented central pillar. The different segments can be rotated by different bomb slots placed throughout the room, and it makes for excellent puzzle solving. Bomb slots are put to great use and make for some of the more interesting moment-to-moment -moment gameplay segments of this game. There are plenty of other small ways that Metroid Prime will offer some unique little gameplay challenges. Sometimes you get an interesting scenario like trying to precision aim your missiles around the oculi in the Tower of Light to lower the platforms. Or maybe you need to navigate a morph ball area and avoid being grabbed by triclops, avoid falling off a thin platform in your morph ball, or simply search around for a way over a lava pit. A personal favorite of mine is in Quarantine Access A hallway. The player finds themselves facing four mega turrets in a small hall where you have the option to slowly pick them off one by one. The more observant player will notice the morph ball hole that allows you to roll under the floor and pop out on the other side of the turrets to disable them from behind. This isn't a complicated scenario, but it doesn't need to be. These kinds of opportunities help illustrate Samus' unique problem-solving skills with her arsenal through playing it out yourself. My go-to example for the best spider ball track is this giant wall in the geothermal core. This part is somewhat infamous because one mistake drops you all the way down into the lava, but I always love this part. It's a gauntlet of precise and careful movement that asks you to be especially careful 
careful with your timing to reach the end. Many Morph Ball Tunnels have interesting gameplay as well, like disappearing platforms you must boost through quickly in the Phazon Mining Tunnel, or pistons moving in a set pattern you have to roll between in the Piston Tunnel. Platforming in Metroid Prime has already come up previously, but I think this is one of Prime's greatest moment-to-moment -moment gameplay offerings. Platforming challenges are frequent in Prime, and though there isn't much of any dynamic momentum or super interesting jumping abilities, they manage to keep things interesting with solid level design. Like I said much earlier in the video, platforming is kept diverse and interesting with things like moving platforms, enemies trying to knock you off, invisible platforms, timed platforms, sinking platforms, and more. It's nothing mind-blowing, but Prime offers a very solid array of platforming gameplay that I always look forward to. On the whole, Metroid Prime has some pretty solid level design. Platforming is excellent, and it's great that there's plenty of it here. There are plenty of inoffensive, light puzzle-solving moments that I don't feel strongly about one way or the other, but there is at least one awesome puzzle in ore processing. There are tons of fun, smaller moments with interesting utilization of many spinner and bomb slots, but some of the time it feels like these spinners are time wasters, like like in the observatory. Solid offering overall. Metroid Prime has two ways of measuring your completion percentage. Your save file will show your standard item collection percentage, but you can also find a separate percentage just for the logbook. I'd like to start with talking about the item collection experience. For optional collectibles, Metroid Prime offers 49 missile tanks, 14 energy tanks, 4 power bomb tanks, and 3 beam combo weapons. Tracking your progression is pretty lacking in Prime, as the only thing you really have to go off of is this item percentage in the pause menu, which wasn't even in the GameCube version. The map doesn't display items in any capacity, and there's no way of tracking what you have and haven't collected. If you're going to 100% this game without a guide, then you're going to have to aimlessly wander the entire world trying to listen carefully for that humming sound. Tracking your item acquisition is pretty lackluster in Prime. The experience of looking for the different expansions around the world is pretty solid, in my opinion. Expansions are hidden behind some fun little challenges and secrets. Some examples include navigating three morph ball pathways before the cooled lava melts, checking behind suspicious walls, or navigating tricky spider ball railways while avoiding damage from enemies. These small challenges are never complicated, but they are sufficiently fun and interesting. Most of the expansions can be collected during your first visit to a level, but there are a good number of expansions that do require you to do some late game cleanup. Fendrana Drifts especially has a number of expansions that require the late game plasma beam. If you're gonna force your player to backtrack all over the world at the end of the game for the artifacts anyways, especially those artifacts in Fendrana Drifts that require the plasma beam, then picking up the expansions during that track isn't so bad. Since you're already passing by, you may as well grab those nearby expansions. This is nowhere near justifying the artifact hunt being required, but I can at least say that these expansions cannot destroy the pacing if the artifacts already did. The neat thing about some of the expansions in this game is that a number of them do have you pushing into new territory and searching new rooms, which absolutely helps keep the experience interesting and worthwhile. I wouldn't call it an issue, more of a missed opportunity, but none of Prime's expansions really challenge you with any of those crazy platforming challenges, like Fusion's Shine Sparking challenges. There's no speed booster, and there are hardly any interesting movement abilities in Prime to utilize in these challenges. The Morph Ball is put to great use since it has excellent traversal abilities, like the Spider Ball and Boost Ball, but it still feels like games like Fusion, Zero Mission, and Dread have a lot more going on with unique challenges utilizing advanced techniques. As far as the intrinsic value goes, Prime's expansions are all fun to search for. There's nothing terribly memorable, but also nothing offensive. It's a good time. In terms of extrinsic value, missiles are useful even in the final boss because of the way that beam combos work. Power bombs stay useful for instantly killing the Metroids in the impact crater, and energy tanks are fairly useful as well. Enemies might do way less damage than I'd like in general, and hard mode has its own issues with pacing, but expansions are especially useful on hard mode. Metroid Prime is really good about making these kinds of expansions feel rewarding to collect, though most people are unlikely to need absolutely everything. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but Prime deserves a lot of credit for finding ways to make expansions feel valuable from the beginning all the way to the final boss. Additionally, collecting 75% or more of the items in the game rewards an extra scene in the ending where Samus will remove her helmet 
and look onto the collapsing impact crater. One last moment to reflect on the events of the game and a very humanizing look at our main character is a memorable way to close the game. Samus' more realistic hair and face suit the Prime Universe well. I think it's great to get a good look at the person underneath the armor, and I especially appreciate that this scene gives us something much more tonally consistent with the Metroid series. This is exactly the kind of thing I'm looking for when it comes to fantastic endgame rewards based on player performance. In addition to this unlockable scene, an additional 100% items post credit scene can also be unlocked. This cutscene hints at a continuation of the Prime story, and gives us a look at what appears to be the Metroid Prime reforming itself inside of the stolen Phazon suit. This extra scene is so ridiculously cool, that's all I can really say about it. On the whole, the 100% experience of Metroid Prime is a fun, mixed bag. I massively appreciate that the expansions are so extrinsically and intrinsically rewarding, but the game doesn't take it as far as some of the 2D games. The expansions do not ruin the pacing at the end of the game, but that's only because the Chozo artifacts already did. The map and pause screen lack numerous features that even Prime's predecessors had, such as item icons on the map. As someone that knows this entire world like the back of their hand, I often 100% this game just for the fun of it, but I think a newcomer is likely to have a bad time without a guide. A solid and worthwhile experience overall, but there's potential for something more. Getting every logbook entry in Metroid Prime is pretty infamous. Take an example of this one monitor here in the beginning of the game. If you don't scan this here and now, then you will never get a chance again and therefore be unable to fully complete your logbook. There are a ton of these throughout the Prime trilogy. Such examples include every single boss, grabbing the maps without scanning one, the Flagra's tentacle being a separate scan from the rest of the creature, these different colored war wasps that only appear during specific boss fights, or enemies that never appear again, like ice parasites, ice burrowers, and ice shriek bats, to name a few. There's nothing more frustrating than making it to the end of the game just to see that you forgot to scan a stalactite or something and discover that you are permanently locked out of completing your logbook. The trilogy and remastered versions add in a New Game Plus logbook carryover, meaning something scanned on a first playthrough will remain in your logbook on repeat playthroughs. These versions also show you your scan percentage on the pause menu. Certain logbook percentage milestones will unlock concept art that can be viewed anytime from the main menu. This art is a fantastic reward, and the remaster even has this gorgeous model viewer. I want to place importance on the model viewer in particular because I'm shocked that this kind of feature is not more common in video games. Model viewers are so much fun to play with, and I am so glad that this was added in the remaster. Oh, there's a model viewer! There's a fucking model viewer! There was no model viewer in the original. That's so cool. I do believe that 100%ing Prime's logbook does deserve its infamous reputation, but I don't think it's something that deserves too much criticism. Yeah, it's irritating that you can so easily miss so much, but since it's just for concept art and models, I don't really see this as some genuine sin of game design or whatever. It's a fun and worthwhile inclusion to reward the player that goes for all of the scans. Metroid Prime, for the first time in the series, does not offer any kind of reward for beating the game quickly. The ending only changes depending on how many items you've collected. This reflects Prime's larger disregard concerning its speedrun potential. Speedrunning Metroid Prime is unlike speedrunning the 2D titles for several reasons. Prime has virtually no advanced move in tech to speak of, meaning there is not much of any opportunity to practice to get better. The enemy encounters are so simple that you similarly cannot practice to get through them much quicker. There are some opportunities to utilize specific specific items like power bombing beam troopers to beat them more quickly, or learning which ones you can outright run past, but a speedrun has less opportunity to flex your skill overall. Prime's very linear item progression and world layout similarly lessen your opportunity to mix things up on repeat playthroughs. There is some optimization with your routing in deciding which elevators to take to get around, but there's not much of this. Fusion offers more interesting combat encounters to master with things like the flare damage, interesting bosses, and its snappy movement tech. And Super offers more routing optimization opportunities with its more nonlinear world and progression. Prime's sort of stuck with the worst of both worlds, offering relatively little to the speedrunner. Prime in general is quite lacking when it comes to offering variation on repeat playthroughs, making it one of the least replayable games in the series. The experience of exploring this uncharted world is completely unforgettable, but that main draw of discovery simply isn't there after your first playthrough. This game doesn't really make up for that with interesting or mechanically substantive gameplay. 
sequence breaking opportunities, or routing optimization. It's my most replayed game of all time, but that's mostly because of my incredible nostalgia for this game. The GameCube 1.0 release has provided me with plenty of glitchy sequence breaks to try out, like I mentioned earlier in the video, but these tricks hardly replace those intuitive tricks found in other games in the series. I don't really care for glitchy sequence breaks, and I only bothered checking out Primes because I'm desperate to see some form of non-linear item ordering in a Prime game. I dislike that none of these tricks can be properly intuited by the player, because that's the whole appeal of sequence breaking for me personally. Depending on who you ask, these more glitchy tricks may or may not suffice in offering interesting replayability in Prime. But again, this is only in one specific version of this game, a version that comes with an array of drawbacks like the lack of control options, no widescreen, original graphics, the original lore that's full of plot issues, or the lack of percentages in the pause menu. I honestly think I prefer the original GameCube 1.0 release of this game, not just because of my nostalgia for the original graphics, but also because I care a lot about replayability in Metroid. But even in the GameCube version, where I can do all kinds of sequence breaking, the Chozo artifacts force me to backtrack all over the world anyways, forcing me into areas that I went out of my way to avoid to save time. Having this endgame fetch quest hurts speedrunning, because all of your efforts to skip items and areas is meaningless if you have to to go back anyways just to collect artifacts. All of Prime's gameplay changes have huge consequences on the speedrunning opportunities in this game. This entire game encourages slow and methodical gameplay, so speedrunning takes an expected hit in potential. The only way to beat the game faster is to have a total mastery of the map for routing optimization, thorough knowledge of enemy and boss strategies, a good understanding of the controls, and a hell of a lot of spamming the boost ball. It's not nearly as thrilling as barreling through some of the other entries in the series like Super, Zero, mission or dread, but it can still be satisfying to flex your knowledge of Prime to see how low you can get your time. Compared to any of the 2D games, the Prime games offer little in speedrunning potential. I think these games are not very replayable with their slower pacing, more linear structure, and end game fetch quests. Taken on their own merits, I think Prime is still at least an okay time for the casual speedrunner. Looking back on my script, I was quite harsh on Metroid Prime. You may not agree with my criticisms, but I hope I've explained myself well enough so that you can at least understand where I'm coming from. It might surprise some of you, but I hold Metroid Prime in a very high regard. I don't think it's the best game in the series, I don't even think it's the best Prime game, but I do think Prime does a lot of things incredibly well. Similar to what I said about Return of Samus, I think that Prime places more emphasis on being an emotionally appealing experience with an incredible atmosphere, story, and presentation. The game appeals to me not so much mechanically, but more with its fantastic presentation, unforgettable music, and immersive gameplay. The narrative of Metroid Prime doesn't really do anything too special or interesting on its own, being a fairly basic plot with tropey and generic ideas, but the story ends up being one of the best things about this game for how it integrates into your exploration. The lore is broken into segmented epistolary writings from different characters of the world, and scattered throughout the planet to reward your exploration and task the player to fit the pieces together themselves. This unique narrative experience in Prime 1 in particular is pulled off in an unforgettable way for refusing to hold your hand, allowing the player to absorb the story at their own pace. Exploration can be described in a similar way, though the world is more linear than it ever has been before. Combined with its very linear item progression, Prime is one of the most linear games in the series in a lot of ways. I don't think that this is a bad thing on its own, but my issue with Prime's more linear structure is that it feels like massive chunks of this game world completely fail to capitalize on the opportunities presented. If you're going to include massive linear chunks, like both visits to the Frigate Orpheon, the Magmore Caverns, the Phazon Mines, and the Fendrana Labs, then the game needed to do more to make these areas mechanically engaging. As they are now, they are easily the worst parts of the gameplay experience. Magmore Caverns in particular divides so much of the world that just exploring to figure out where to go becomes an absolute slog. It's incredibly tedious to again and again travel through Magmore just to check different levels that refuse to connect directly, such as Talon Overworld and Fendrana Drifts. The pacing in general is the other big issue with Prime, and the issue is exacerbated by the endgame fetch quest that is the Chozo Artifacts. Despite these issues with this game, I still consider it one of my top 5 Metroid games, not just because I'm so nostalgic towards this game, but also the massive chunks of the world that are the Chozo Ruins and the Fendrana Drifts. Minus the Pirate Lab, these areas are some of the best areas in the entire Metroid series for offering that delicious, exploration-focused gameplay loop in an engrossing game world. The presentation and gameplay of Metroid Prime are immersive, 
but the alien-made structures are often built in a way that completely takes me out of the immersion. The combat and bosses in general are some of the worst that Metroid has ever seen, but there are some notable exceptions like the Chozo ghost enemies, the Shigoth, Thardis, and especially the Metroid Prime boss fight. While Metroid Prime is a fantastic game, I do think it suffers from a mild to moderate case of first game syndrome. A lot of the issues that I've been bringing up get directly addressed in the sequel games, and I'm really excited to get around to talking about those games eventually. But here in Prime 1, I think it's very apparent that there is plenty of room for improvement. It's completely amazing that Retro managed to release a game anywhere near this good under such incredible circumstances, but I think some areas do show their development crunch with blatantly recycled enemies and assets. Taking all of Metroid Prime's strengths and weaknesses into account, I think it's easy for me to say that the many incredible strengths far outweigh the irritating and boring low points of this game. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is often so boring, but I can't help but continue to feel completely engrossed by Talon 4's immaculate atmosphere and storytelling. Even that storytelling comes with its own small issues, but none of that really matters to me at the end of the day because I'm too busy appreciating the profound intrigue with trying to piece everything together. A lot of the time, I'm not even necessarily speculating on the main events leading to the game, but maybe I'm doing something like trying to imagine the space pirates taking their pet Gronkats and Olbabs to work. The inconsequential lore bits end up being some of the most interesting parts of the game world because they flesh everything out in an endearing way. Metroid Prime deserves to be remembered as one of the all-time greats for its incredible atmosphere and unique style of storytelling, but also, it's player-driven exploration gameplay. If you value atmosphere, lore, series iconography, slower pacing, and player-driven discovery, then you'll probably adore Metroid Prime. If you prefer mechanically substantive gameplay, sequence breaking, replayability, speedrunning, and fast pacing, then you might find that Prime is disappointing. Prime is an incredible game experience that I recommend everyone at least try for themselves, especially with the excellent remaster that blew my socks off. I appreciate you taking the time to watch all of my very critical dissection of Metroid Prime. I hope I was able to entertain and offer something interesting to the ongoing conversation of Metroid Prime. Fundamentally changing the dynamic... Pinto, I'm trying to... I'm trying to... Kenny.